Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. Chapter 23. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23. Fruits and Flowers of Maryland and Virginia. Copperhead Snake. Insects. Elections. Our summer in Maryland, 1830, was delightful. The thermometer stood at 94, but the heat was by no means so oppressive as what we had felt in the West. In no part of North America are the natural productions of the soil more various or more beautiful. Strawberries of the richest flavour sprung beneath our feet, and when these passed away every grove, every lane, every field looked like a cherry orchard offering an inexhaustible profusion of fruit to all who would take the trouble to gather it. Then followed the peaches, every hedgerow was planted with them, and though the fruit did not equal in size or flavour those ripened on our garden walls, we often found them good enough to afford a delicious refreshment on our long rambles. But it was the flowers and the flowering shrubs that beyond all else rendered this region the most beautiful I had ever seen, the Allegheny always excepted. No description can give an idea of the variety, the profusion, the luxuriance of them. If I talk of wild roses, the English reader will fancy I mean the pale ephemeral blossoms of our bramble hedges, but the wild roses of Maryland and Virginia might be the choicest favourites of the flower garden. They are rarely very double, but the brilliant eye atones for this. They are of all shades, from the deepest crimson to the tenderest pink. The scent is rich and delicate. In size they exceed any single roses I ever saw, often measuring above four inches in diameter. The leaf greatly resembles that of the china rose. It is large, dark, firm, and brilliant. The sweetbriar grows wild and blossoms abundantly. Both leaves and flowers are considerably larger than with us. The acacia, or as it is there called, the locust, blooms with great richness and profusion. I have gathered a branch less than a foot long, and counted twelve full bunches of flowers on it. The scent is equal to the orange flower. The dogwood is another of the splendid white blossoms that adorn the woods. Its lateral branches are flat like a fan, and dotted all over with star-like blossoms, as large as those of the gum cistus. Another pretty shrub of smaller size is the poison alder. It is well that its noxious qualities are very generally known, for it is most tempting to the eye by its delicate fringe-like bunches of white flowers. Even the touch of this shrub is poisonous and produces violent sweating. The arbor judae is abundant in every wood, and its bright and delicate pink is the earliest harbinger of the American spring. Azaleas, white, yellow, and pink, calmias of every variety, the two sweet magnolia, and the stately rhododendron all grow in wild abundance there. The plant known in England as the Virginian creeper is often seen climbing to the top of the highest forest trees, and bearing a large trumpet-shaped blossom out of a rich scarlet. The sassafras is a beautiful shrub, and I cannot imagine why it has not been naturalized in England, for it has every appearance of being extremely hardy. The leaves grow in tufts, and every tuft contains leaves of five or six different forms. The fruit is singularly beautiful. It resembles in form a small acorn, and is jet black, the cup and stem looking as if they were made of red coral. The graceful and fantastic grapevine is a feature of great beauty, and its wandering festoons bear no more resemblance to our well-trained vines than our stunted azaleas and tiny magnolias to their thriving American kindred. There is another charm that haunts the summer wanderer in America, and it is perhaps the only one found in greatest perfection in the West, but it is beautiful everywhere. In a bright day, during any of the summer months, your walk is through an atmosphere of butterflies, so gaudy in hue and so varied in form that I often thought they looked like flowers on the wing. Some of them are very large, measuring three or four inches across the wings, but many, and I think the most beautiful, are smaller than ours. Some have wings of the most dainty lavender colour, and bodies of black, others are fawn and rose colour, and others again are orange and bright blue. But pretty as they are, it is their number, even more than their beauty, that delights the eye. Their gay and noiseless movement as they glance through the air, 
crossing each other in checkered maze, is very beautiful. The hummingbird is another pretty summer toy, but they are not sufficiently numerous, nor do they live enough on the wing to render them so important a feature in the transatlantic show as the rainbow-tinted butterflies. The firefly was a far more brilliant novelty. In moist situations, or before a storm, they are very numerous, and in the dark, sultry evening of a burning day, when all employment was impossible, I have often found it a pastime to watch their glancing light, now here, now there, now seen, now gone, shooting past with the rapidity of lightning, and looking like a shower of falling stars, blown about in the breeze of evening." In one of our excursions we encountered and slew a copperhead snake. I escaped treading on it by about three inches. While we were contemplating our conquered foe, and doubting in our ignorance if he were indeed the deadly copperhead we had so often heard described, a farmer joined us, who as soon as he cast his eyes on our victim exclaimed, "'My, if you have not got a copper! That's right down well done! They be darnation beasts!' He told us that he had once seen a copperhead bite himself to death from being teased by a stick, while confined in a cage where he could find no other victim. We often heard terrible accounts of the number of these desperate reptiles to be found on the rocks near the great falls of the Potomac, but not even the terror these stories inspired could prevent our repeated visits to that sublime scene. Luckily our temerity was never punished by seeing any there. Lizards, long and large, and most hideously like a miniature crocodile, I frequently saw gliding from the fissures of the rocks, and darting again under shelter, perhaps beneath the very stone I was seated upon, but every one assured us they were harmless. Animal life is so infinitely abundant, and in form so various, and so novel to European eyes, that it is absolutely necessary to divest oneself of all the petty terrors which the crawling, creeping, hopping, and buzzing tribes can inspire, before taking an American summer ramble. It is, I conceive, quite impossible for any descriptions to convey an idea of the sounds which assail the ears from the time the short twilight begins, until the rising sun scatters the rear of darkness, and sends the winking choristers to rest. Be where you will, excepting in the large cities, the appalling note of the bullfrog will reach you, loud, deep, and hoarse, issuing from a thousand throats in ceaseless continuity of croak. The tree-frog adds her chirping an almost human voice. The katydid repeats her own name through the live-long night. The whole tribe of locusts chirp, chirp, squeak, whiz, and whistle, without allowing one instant of interval to the weary ear. And when to this the mosquito adds her threatening hum, it is wonderful that any degree of fatigue can obtain for the listener the relief of sleep. In fact, it is only in ceasing to listen that this blessing can be found. I passed many feverish nights during my first summer, literally in listening to this most astounding mixture of noises, and it was only when they became too familiar to excite attention that I recovered my rest. I know not by what whimsical link of association the recapitulation of this insect din suggests the recollection of other discords, at least as harsh, and much more troublesome. Even in the retirement in which we passed the summer, we were not beyond the reach of the election fever which is constantly raging through the land. Had America every attraction under heaven that nature and social enjoyment can offer, this electioneering madness would make me fly it in disgust. It engrosses every conversation, it irritates every temper, it substitutes party spirit for personal esteem, and in fact vitiates the whole system of society. When a candidate for any office starts, his party endow him with every virtue and with all the talents. They are all ready to peck out the eyes of those who oppose him, and in the warm and mettlesome southwestern states do literally often perform this operation. But as soon as he succeeds, his virtues and his talents vanish, and excepting those holding office under his appointment, every man Jonathan of them set off again full gallop to elect his successor. When I first arrived in America, Mr. John Quincy Adams was president, and it was impossible to doubt, even from the statement of his enemies, that he was every way calculated to do honour to the office. 
All I ever heard against him was that he was too much of a gentleman, but a new candidate must be set up, and Mr. Adams was outvoted for no other reason that I could learn but because it was best to change. Jackson for ever was therefore screamed from the majority of mouths, both drunk and sober, till he was elected, but no sooner in his place than the same ceaseless operation went on again, with clay for ever, for its war-hoop. I was one morning paying a visit when a party of gentlemen arrived at the same house on horseback. The one whose heir proclaimed him the chief of his party left us not long in doubt as to his business, for he said, almost in entering, "'Mr. P., I come to ask for your vote.' "'Who are you for, sir?' was the reply. "'Clay for ever,' the rejoinder, and the vote was promised. The gentleman was the candidate for a place in the state representation whose members have a vote in the presidential election. I was introduced to him as an Englishwoman. He addressed me with, "'Well, madam, you see we do these things openly and above board here. You mince such matters more, I expect.' After his departure, his history and standing were discussed. Mr. M. is highly respectable and of very good standing. There can be no doubt of his election, if he is a thorough-going clay man, said my host. I asked what his station was. The lady of the house told me that his father had been a merchant, and when this future legislator was a young man, he had been sent by him to some port in the Mediterranean as his supercargo. The youth, being a free-born, high-spirited youth, appropriated the proceeds to his own uses, traded with great success upon the fund thus obtained, and returned after an absence of twelve years a gentleman of fortune and excellent standing. I expressed some little disapprobation of this proceeding, but was assured that Mr. M. was considered by every one as a very honourable man. Were I to relate one-tenth part of the dishonest transactions recounted to me by Americans, of their fellow-citizens and friends, I am confident that no English reader would give me credit for veracity. It would therefore be very unwise to repeat them, but I cannot refrain from expressing the opinion that nearly four years of attentive observation impressed on me, namely, that the moral sense is on every point blunter than with us. Make an American believe that his next-door neighbour is a very worthless fellow, and I dare say, if he were quite sure he could make nothing by him, he would drop the acquaintance. But as to what constitutes a worthless fellow, people differ on opposite sides of the Atlantic, almost by the whole decalogue. There is, as it appeared to me, an obtusity on all points of honourable feeling. Cervantes laughed Spain's chivalry away but he did not laugh away that better part of chivalry, so beautifully described by Burke as the unbought grace of life, the cheap defence of nations, that chastity of honour, which feels a stain as a wound, which ennobles whatever it touches, and by which vice itself loses half its evil by losing all its grossness. The better part of chivalry still mixes with gentle blood in every part of Europe, nor is it less fondly guarded than when sword and buckler aided its defence. Perhaps this unbought grace of life is not to be looked for where chivalry has never been. I certainly do not lament the decadence of knight-errantry, nor wish to exchange the protection of the laws for that of the doughtiest champion who ever set lance in rest. But I do, in truth, believe that this knightly sensitiveness of honourable feeling is the best antidote to the petty, soul-degrading transactions of everyday life, and that the total want of it is one reason why this free-born race cares so very little for the vulgar virtue called probity. End of chapter 23《Chapter Twenty Four of Domestic Manners of the Americans》by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Four: Journey to Philadelphia, Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, City of Philadelphia, Miss Wright's Lecture. In the latter part of August, eighteen thirty, we paid a visit to Philadelphia, and notwithstanding the season, we were so fortunate as to have both bright and temperate weather for the expedition. The road from Washington to Baltimore, which was our first day's journey, is interesting in summer from the variety of luxuriance of the foliage which borders great parts of it. 
We passed the night at Baltimore, and embarked next morning on board a steamboat for Philadelphia. The scenery of the Elk River, upon which you enter soon after leaving the port of Baltimore, is not beautiful. We embarked at six in the morning, and at twelve reached the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal. We then quitted the steamboat, and walked two or three hundred yards to the canal, where we got on board a pretty little decked boat, sheltered by a neat awning and drawn by four horses. This canal cuts across the state of Delaware, and connects the Chesapeake and Delaware rivers. It has been a work of great expense, though the distance is not more than thirteen miles. For a considerable part of this distance, the cutting has been very deep, and the banks are in many parts thatched, to prevent their crumbling. At the point where the cutting is deepest, a light bridge is thrown across, which from its great height forms a striking object to the travellers passing below it. Every boat that passes this canal pays a toll of twenty dollars. Nothing can be less interesting than that part of the state of Delaware through which this cut passes, the Mississippi hardly accepted. At one we reached the Delaware River, at a point nearly opposite Delaware Fort, which looks recently built and is very handsome. This fort was destroyed by fire a few months afterwards. Here we again changed our vessel, and got on board another of their noble steamboats. Both these changes were made with the greatest regularity and dispatch. There is nothing remarkable in the scenery of the Delaware. The stream is wide and the banks are flat. A short distance before you reach Philadelphia, two large buildings of singular appearance strike the eye. On inquiry I learned that they were erected for the purpose of sheltering two ships of war. They are handsomely finished with very neat roofs, and are ventilated by many windows. The expense of these buildings must have been considerable, but as the construction of the vast machines they shelter was more so, it may be good economy. We reached Philadelphia at four o'clock in the afternoon. The approach to this city is not so striking as that to Baltimore. Though much larger, it does not show itself so well. It wants domes and columns. It is, nevertheless, a beautiful city. Nothing can exceed its neatness. The streets are well paved. The footway, as in all the old American cities, is of brick, like the old Pantile Walk at Tunbridge Wells. This is almost entirely sheltered from the sun by the awnings, which in all the principal streets are spread from the shop windows to the edge of the pavement. The city is built with extreme and almost wearisome regularity. The streets which run north and south are distinguished by numbers from one to, I know not how many, but I paid a visit in Twelfth Street. These are intersected at right angles by others, which are known by the names of various trees. Mulberry, more commonly called Art Street, Chestnut and Walnut, appear the most fashionable. In each of these there is a theatre. This mode of distinguishing the streets is commodious to strangers, from the facility it gives of finding out whereabouts you are. If you ask for the United States Bank, you are told it is in Chestnut between third and fourth, and as the streets are all divided from each other by equal distances of about three hundred feet, you are sure of not missing your mark. There are many handsome houses, but none that are very splendid. They are generally of brick, and those of the better order have white marble steps, and some few door frames of the same beautiful material, but on the whole there is less display of it in the private dwellings than at Baltimore. The Americans all seem greatly to admire this city, and to give it the preference and point of beauty to all others in the Union, but I do not agree with them. There are some very handsome buildings, but none of them so placed as to produce a striking effect, as is the case both with the Capitol and the President's house at Washington. Notwithstanding these fine buildings, one or more of which are to be found in all the principal streets, the coup d'oeil is everywhere the same. There is no Place de Louis XV or Carousel, no Regent Street or Green Park, to make one exclaim, how beautiful, all is even, straight, uniform and uninteresting. There is one spot, however, about a mile from the town, which presents a lovely scene. The waterworks of Philadelphia have not yet perhaps as wide extended fame as those of Marley, but they are not less deserving it. At a most beautiful point of the Schuylkill River, the water has been forced up into a magnificent reservoir, ample and elevated enough to send it through the whole city. 
The vast yet simple machinery by which this is achieved is open to the public, who resort in such numbers to see it, that several evening stages run from Philadelphia to Fairmount for their accommodation. But interesting and curious as this machinery is, Fairmount would not be so attractive had it not something else to offer. It is, in truth, one of the very prettiest spots the eye can look upon. A broad weir is thrown across the schoolkill, which produces the sound and look of a cascade. On the farther side of the river is a gentleman's seat, the beautiful lawns of which slope to the water's edge, and groups of weeping willows and other trees throw their shadows on the stream. The works themselves are enclosed in a simple but very handsome building of freestone, which has an extended front opening upon a terrace which overhangs the river. Behind the building, and divided from it only by a lawn, rises a lofty wall of solid limestone rock, which has at one or two points been cut into for the passage of the water into the noble reservoir above. From the crevices of this rock, the catalpa was everywhere pushing forth, covered with its beautiful blossom. Beneath one of these trees an artificial opening in the rock gives passage to a stream of water, clear and bright as crystal, which is received in a stone basin of simple workmanship, having a cup for the service of the thirsty traveller. At another point a portion of the water in its upward way to the reservoir is permitted to spring forth in a perpetual jet d'eau that returns in a silver shower upon the head of a marble naiad of snowy whiteness. The statue is not the work of Phidias, but its dark rocky background, the flowery catalpas which shadow it, and the bright shower through which it shows itself, altogether make the scene one of singular beauty. Add to which the evening on which I saw it was very sultry, and the contrast of this cool spot to all besides certainly enhanced its attraction. It was impossible not to empty the nymph in her eternal shower-bath. On returning from this excursion, we saw handbills in all parts of the city, announcing that Miss Wright was on that evening to deliver her parting address to the citizens of Philadelphia at the Art Street Theatre, previous to her departure for Europe. I immediately determined to hear her, and did so, though not without some difficulty, from the crowds who went thither with the same intention. The house, which is a very pretty one, was filled in every part, including the stage, with a well-dressed and most attentive audience. There was a larger proportion of ladies present than I ever saw on any other occasion in an American theatre. One reason for this might be, perhaps, that they were admitted gratis. Miss Wright came on the stage, surrounded by a bodyguard of Quaker ladies, in the full costume of their sect. She was, as she always is, startling in her theories, but powerfully eloquent, and on the whole was much applauded, though one passage produced great emotion and some hissing. She stated broadly, on the authority of Jefferson, furnished by his posthumous works, that Washington was not a Christian. One voice from the crowded pit exclaimed, in an accent of indignation, Washington was a Christian but it was evident that the majority of the audience considered Mr. Jefferson's assertion as a compliment to the country's idol, for the hissing was soon triumphantly clapped down. General Washington himself, however, gives a somewhat different account of his own principles, for in his admirable farewell address on declining a re-election to the presidency, I find the following passage. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, Religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who would labour to subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the destinies of men and citizens. A volume could not trace all their connections with private and public felicity. And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion, Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Whether Mr. Jefferson or himself knew best what his principles were, I will not decide, but at least it appears fair, when repeating one statement, to add the other also. End of chapter 24
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Five Washington Square, American Beauty, Gallery of Fine Arts, Antiques, Theatres, Museum. Our mornings were spent, as all travellers' mornings must be, in asking questions and in seeing all that the answers told us it was necessary to see. Perhaps this can be done in no city with more facility than in Philadelphia. You have nothing to do but to walk up one straight street and down another till all the parallelograms have been threaded. In doing this you will see many things worth looking at. The United States and Pennsylvania banks are the most striking buildings, and are both extremely handsome, being of white marble, and built after Grecian models. The State House has nothing externally to recommend it, but the room shown is that in which the Declaration of Independence was signed, and in which the estimable Lafayette was received half a century after he had shed his noble blood in aiding to obtain it, is an interesting spot. At one end of this room is a statue in wood of General Washington. On its base is the following inscription, First in peace, first in war, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. There is a very pretty enclosure before the Walnut Street entrance to the State House, with good, well-kept gravel walks, and many of their beautiful flowering trees. It is laid down in grass, not in turf. That, indeed, is a luxury I never saw in America. Near this enclosure is another of much the same description, called Washington Square. Here there was an excellent crop of clover, but as the trees are numerous and highly beautiful, and several commodious seats are placed beneath their shade, it is, in spite of the long grass, a very agreeable retreat from heat and dust. It was rarely, however, that I saw any of these seats occupied. The Americans have either no leisure or no inclination for those moments of déclassement that all other people, I believe, indulge in. Even their drams, so universally taken by rich and poor, are swallowed standing, and excepting at church they never have the air of leisure or repose. This pretty Washington Square is surrounded by houses on three signs, but, lasso, has a prison on the fourth, it is nevertheless the nearest approach to a London square that is to be found in Philadelphia. One evening, while the rest of my party went to visit some objects which I had before seen, I agreed to await their return in this square, and sat down under a magnificent catalpa which threw its fragrant blossoms in all directions. The other end of the bench was occupied by a young lady who was employed in watching the gambols of a little boy. There was something in her manner of looking at me, and exchanging a smile, when her young charge performed some extraordinary feat of activity on the grass, that persuaded me she was not an American. I do not remember who spoke first, but we were presently in a full flow of conversation. She spoke English with elegant correctness, but she was a German, and with an ardour of feeling which gave her a decidedly foreign air in Philadelphia, she talked to me of her country, of all she had left, and of all she had found, or rather of all she had not found, for thus ran her lament. They do not love music, oh no, and they never amuse themselves, no, and their hearts are not warm, at least they seem not so to strangers, and they have no ease, no forgetfulness of business and of care, no, not for a moment, but I will not stay long, I think, for I should not live. She told me that she had a brother settled there as a merchant, and that she had passed a year with him, but she was hoping soon to return to her fatherland. I never so strongly felt the truth of the remark that expression is the soul of beauty as in looking at and listening to this young German. She was anything but handsome. It is true she had large eyes, full of gentle expression, but every feature was irregular. But, oh, the charm of that smile, of that look of deep feeling which animated every feature when she spoke of her own Germany, the tone of her voice, the slight and graceful action which accompanied her words, all struck me as so attractive that the half-hour I passed with her was continually recurring to my memory. I had often taxed myself with feeling something like prejudice against the beautiful American women, but this half-hour set my conscience at rest. It is not prejudice which causes one to feel that regularity of features is insufficient to interest, or even to please, beyond the first glance. 
I certainly believe the women of America to be the handsomest in the world, but as surely do I believe that they are the least attractive. We visited the nineteenth annual exhibition of the Pennsylvanian Academy of the Fine Arts. Four hundred and thirty-one was the number of objects exhibited, which were so arranged as to fill three tolerably large rooms, and one smaller, called the director's room. There were among the number about thirty engravings, and a much larger proportion of water-coloured drawings. About seventy had the P.A., Pennsylvanian Academician, annexed to the name of the artist. The principal historical composition was a large scripture piece by Mr. Washington Alston. This gentleman is spoken of as an artist of great merit, and I was told that his manner was much improved since this picture was painted. It bears date, 1813. I believe it was for this picture Mr. Alston received a prize at the British Gallery. There was a portrait of a lady which in the catalogue is designated as the White Plume, which had the reputation of being the most admired in the collection, and the artist, Mr. Ingham, is said to rank highest among the portrait painters of America. The picture is of very high finish, particularly the drapery, which is most elaborately worked, even to the pile of velvet. The management of the light is much in the manner of good, but the drawing is very defective, and the contour, though the face is a lovely one, hard and unfleshy. From all the conversations on painting which I listened to in America, I found that the finish of drapery was considered as the highest excellence, and next to this the resemblance in a portrait. I do not remember ever to have heard the words drawing or composition used in any conversation on the subject. One of the rooms of this academy has inscribed over its door, Antique Statue Gallery. The door was open, but just within it was a screen, which prevented any objects in the room being seen from without. Upon my pausing to read this inscription, an old woman who appeared to officiate as guardian of the gallery, hustled up, and addressing me with an air of much mystery, said, "'Now, ma'am, now, this is just the time for you. Nobody can see you. Make haste.' I stared at her with unfeigned surprise, and disengaging my arm, which she had taken apparently to hasten my movements, I very gravely asked her meaning. "'Only, ma'am, that ladies like to go into that room by themselves, when there be no gentlemen watching them.' On entering this mysterious apartment, the first thing I remarked was written paper, deprecating the disgusting depravity which had led some of the visitors to mark and deface the casts in a most indecent and shameless manner. This abomination has unquestionably been occasioned by the coarse-minded custom which sends alternate groups of males and females into the room. Were the antique gallery thrown open to mixed parties of ladies and gentlemen, it would soon cease. Till America has reached the degree of refinement which permits of this, the antique cast should not be exhibited to ladies at all. I never felt my delicacy shocked at the Louvre, but I was strangely tempted to resent as an affront the hint I received that I might steal a glance at what was deemed indecent. Perhaps the arrangements for the exhibition of this room, the feelings which have led to them, and the result they have produced, furnish as good a specimen of the kind of delicacy on which the Americans pride themselves, and of the peculiarities arising from it, as can be found. The room contains about fifty casts, chiefly from the antique. In the director's room I was amused at the means which a poet had hit upon for advertising his works, or rather his work, and not less at the elaborate notice of it. His portrait was suspended there, and attached to the frame was a paper inscribed thus, Portrait of the Author of the Fredoniad, or Independence Preserved, a political, naval, and military poem on the late war of 1812 in forty cantos, the whole compressed in four volumes, each volume averaging more than three hundred and five pages, by Richard Emmons, M.D. I went to the Chestnut Street Theatre, to see Mr. Booth, formerly of Drury Lane, in the character of Lear, and a Mrs. Duff in Cordelia, but I have seen too many Lears and Cordelias to be easily pleased. I thought the whole performance very bad. The theatre is of excellent moderate dimensions, and prettily decorated. 
It was not the fashionable season for the theatres, which I presume must account for the appearance of the company in the boxes, which was anything but elegant, nor was there more decorum of demeanour than I had observed elsewhere. I saw one man in the lower tier of boxes deliberately take off his coat that he might enjoy the refreshing coolness of shirt-sleeves. All the gentlemen wore their hats, and the spitting was unceasing. On another evening we went to the Walnut Street Theatre. The chief attraction of the night was furnished by the performance of a young man who had been previously exhibited as a living skeleton. He played the part of Jeremiah Thin, and certainly looked the part well, and here, I think, must end my praise of the evening's performances. The great and most striking contrast between this city and those of Europe is perceived after sunset. Scarcely a sound is heard, hardly a voice or a wheel breaks the stillness. The streets are entirely dark, except where a stray lamp marks a hotel or the like. No shops are open but those of the apothecary, and here and there a cook's shop. Scarcely a step is heard, and for a note of music or the sound of mirth I listened in vain. In leaving the theatre, which I always did before the afterpiece, I saw not a single carriage. The night of Miss Wright's lecture, when I stayed to the end, I saw one. This darkness, this stillness is so great, that I almost felt it awful. As we walked home one fine moonlight evening from the Chestnut Street house, we stopped a moment before the United States Bank to look at its white marble columns by the subdued lights said to be so advantageous to them. The building did indeed look beautiful. The incongruous objects around were hardly visible, while the brilliant white of the building, which by daylight is dazzling, was mellowed into fainter light and softer shadow. While pausing before this modern temple of Theseus, we remarked that we alone seemed alive in this great city. It was ten o'clock and a most lovely cool evening after a burning day, yet all was silence. Regent Street, Bond Street, with their blaze of gaslight bijouterie, and still more the Italian boulevard of Paris, rose in strong contrast on the memory. The light which outshines that of day, the gay, graceful, laughing throng, the elegant saloons of Tortoni, with all their varieties of cooling nectar, were all remembered. Is it a European prejudice to deem that the solitary dram, swallowed by the gentleman on quitting an American theatre, indicates a lower and more vicious state of manners than do the ices so sedulously offered to the ladies on leaving a French one? The museum contains a good collection of objects illustrative of natural history, and some very interesting specimens of Indian antiquities. Both here and at Cincinnati I saw so many things resembling Egyptian relics that I should like to see the origin of the Indian nations inquired into more accurately than has yet been done. The shops, of which there appeared to me to be an unusually large proportion, are very handsome, many of them in a style of European elegance. Lottery offices abound, and that species of gambling is carried to a great extent. I saw fewer carriages in Philadelphia than either at Baltimore or Washington, but in the winter, I was told, they were more numerous. Many of the best families had left the city for different watering places, and others were daily following. Long Branch is a fashionable bathing place on the Jersey shore, to which many resort, both from this place and from New York. The description given of the manner of bathing appeared to me rather extraordinary, but the account was confirmed by so many different people that I could not doubt its correctness. The shore, it seems, is too bold to admit of bathing machines, and the ladies have therefore recourse to another mode of ensuring the enjoyment of a sea bath with safety. The accommodation at Long Branch is almost entirely at large boarding houses where all the company live at a table d'hôte. It is customary for ladies on arriving to look round among the married gentlemen the first time they meet at table, and to select the one her fancy leads her to prefer as a protector in her proposed visits to the realms of Neptune. She makes a request, which is always graciously received, that he would lead her to taste the briny wave, but another fair one must select the same protector, else the arrangement cannot be complete, as custom does not authorize tete-a-tete -tete immersion. End of chapter 25
Chapter twenty six of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty six Quakers, Presbyterians, Itinerant Methodist Preacher, Market, Influence of Females in Society. I had never chanced among all my wanderings to enter a Quaker meeting house, and as I thought I could nowhere make my first visit better than at Philadelphia. I went under the protection of a Quaker lady to the principal orthodox meeting of the city. The building is large, but perfectly without ornament. The men and women are separated by a rail which divides it into two equal parts. The meeting was very full on both sides, and the atmosphere almost intolerably hot. As they glided in at their different doors, I spied many pretty faces peeping from the prim headgear of the females and as the broad-brimmed males sat down, the welcome Parnay supposes prepared for them in heaven recurred to me, Entre donc et garde ton chapeau. The little bonnets and the large hats were ranged in long rows, and their stillness was for a long time so unbroken that I could hardly persuade myself the figures they surmounted were alive. At length the grave square man arose, laid aside his ample beaver, and after another solemn interval of silence, he gave a deep groan, and as it were by the same effort uttered, Keep thy foot. Again he was silent for many minutes, and then he continued for more than an hour to put forth one word at a time, but at such an interval from each other that I found it quite impossible to follow his meaning, if indeed he had any. My Quaker friend told me she knew not who he was, and that she much regretted I had heard so poor a preacher. After he had concluded, a gentleman-like old man, a physician by profession, arose and delivered a few moral sentences in an agreeable manner. Soon after he had sat down, the whole congregation rose, I know not at what signal, and made their exit. It is a singular kind of worship, if worship it may be called, where all prayer is forbidden. Yet it appeared to me, in its decent quietness, infinitely preferable to what I had witnessed at the Presbyterian and Methodist meeting-houses. A great schism had lately taken place among the Quakers of Philadelphia, many objecting to the over-strict discipline of the Orthodox. Among the seceders there are again various shades of difference. I met many who called themselves Unitarian Quakers, others were Hicksites, and others again, though still wearing the Quaker habit, were said to be deists. We visited many churches and chapels in the city, but none that would elsewhere be called handsome, either internally or externally. I went one evening, not a Sunday, with a party of ladies, to see a Presbyterian minister inducted. The ceremony was woefully long, and the charge to the young man awfully impossible to obey, at least if he were a man like unto other men. It was a matter of astonishment to me to observe the deep attention and the unwearied patience with which some hundreds of beautiful young girls, who were assembled there, not to mention the old ladies, listened to the whole of this tedious ceremony. Surely there is no country in the world where religion makes so large a part of the amusement and occupation of the ladies. Spain, in its most Catholic days, could not exceed it. Besides, in spite of the gloomy horrors of the Inquisition, Gaiety and amusement were not there offered as a sacrifice by the young and lovely. The religious severity of Philadelphian manners is in nothing more conspicuous than in the number of chains thrown across the streets on a Sunday to prevent horses and carriages from passing. Surely the Jews could not exceed this country in their external observances. What the gentlemen of Philadelphia do with themselves on a Sunday I will not pretend to guess but the prodigious majority of females in the churches is very remarkable. Although a large proportion of the population of this city are Quakers, the same extraordinary variety of faith exists here as everywhere else in the Union, and the priests have in some circles the same unbounded influence which has been mentioned elsewhere. One history reached me which gave a terrible picture of the effect this power may produce. It was related to me by my mantua-maker, a young woman highly estimable as a wife and mother, and on whose veracity I perfectly rely. She told me that her father was a widower, and lived with his family of three daughters in Philadelphia. 
A short time before she married, an itinerant preacher came to the city, who contrived to obtain an intimate footing in many respectable families. Her father's was one of these, and his influence and authority were great with all the sisters, but particularly with the youngest. The young girl's feelings for him seemed to have been a curious mixture of spiritual awe and earthly affection. When she received a hint from her sisters that she ought not to give him too much encouragement till he spoke out, she showed as much holy resentment as if they had told her not to say her prayers too devoutly. At length the father remarked the sort of covert passion that gleamed through the eyes of his godly visitor, and he saw, too, the pallid anxious look which had settled on the young brow of his daughter. Either this, or some rumours he had heard abroad, or both together, led him to forbid this man his house. The three girls were present when he did so, and all uttered a deprecating, "'Oh, father!' But the old man added stoutly, "'If you show yourself here again, reverend sir, I will not only teach you the way out of my house, but out of the city also.' The preacher withdrew, and was never heard of in Philadelphia afterwards, but when a few months had passed, strange whispers began to creep through the circle which had received and honoured him, and in due course of time no less than seven unfortunate girls produced living proofs of the wisdom of my informant's worthy father. In defence of this dreadful story, I can only make the often repeated quotation, I tell the tale as t'was told to me, but in all sincerity I must add that I have no doubt of its truth. I was particularly requested to visit the market of Philadelphia, at the hour when it presented the busiest scene. I did so, and thought few cities had anything to show better worth looking at. It is, indeed, the very perfection of a market, the beau ideal of a notable housewife, who would confide to no deputy the important office of caterer. The neatness, freshness, and entire absence of everything disagreeable to sight or smell must be witnessed to be believed. The stalls were spread with snow-white napkins. Flowers and fruit, if not quite of Paris or London perfection, yet bright, fresh, and fragrant, with excellent vegetables in the greatest variety and abundance, were all so delightfully exhibited that objects less pleasing were overlooked and forgotten. The dairy, the poultry-yard, the forest, the river, and the ocean, all contributed their spoil. In short, for the first time in my life, I thought a market a beautiful object. The prices of most articles were, as dearly as I could calculate between dollars and francs, about the same as at Paris, certainly much cheaper than in London, but much dearer than at Exeter. My letters of introduction brought me acquainted with several amiable and interesting people, there is something in the tone of manners at Philadelphia that I liked. It appeared to me that there was less affectation of ton there than elsewhere. There is a quietness, a composure in a Philadelphia drawing-room that is quite characteristic of a city founded by William Penn. The dress of the ladies, even those who are not Quakers, partakes of this. They are most elegantly neat, and there was a delicacy and good taste in the dress of the young ladies that might serve as a model to the whole union. There can hardly be a stronger contrast in the style of dress between any two cities than may be remarked between Baltimore and Philadelphia. Both are costly, but the former is distinguished by gaudy splendour, the latter by elegant simplicity. It is said that this city has many gentlemen distinguished by their scientific pursuits. I conversed with several well-informed and intelligent men, but there is a cold dryness of manner and an apparent want of interest in the subjects they discussed, that to my mind robs conversation of all its charm. On one occasion I heard the character and situation of an illustrious officer discussed, who had served with renown under Napoleon, and whose high character might have obtained him a favour under the Bourbons, could he have abandoned the principles which led him to dislike their government. This distinguished man had retreated to America after the death of his master, and was endeavouring to establish a sort of polytechnic academy at New York. In speaking of him, I observed that his devotion to the cause of freedom must prove a strong recommendation in the United States. "'Not the least in the world, madam,' answered a gentleman who ranked deservedly high among the literati of the city. 
It might avail him much in England, perhaps, but here we are perfectly indifferent as to what people's principles may be. This I believe to be exactly true, though I never before heard it avowed as a national feature. The want of warmth, of interest, of feeling upon all subjects which do not immediately touch their own concerns is universal, and has a most paralyzing effect upon conversation. All the enthusiasm of America is concentrated to the one point of her own emancipation and independence. On this point nothing can exceed the warmth of her feelings. She may, I think, be compared to a young bride, a sort of Mrs. Major Waddle. Her independence is to her as a newly won bridegroom. For him alone she has eyes, ears, or heart. The honeymoon is not yet over. When it is, America will, perhaps, learn more coquetry, and know better how to faire l'aimable to other nations. I conceive that no place in the known world can furnish so striking a proof of the immense value of literary habits as the United States, not only in enlarging the mind, but what is of infinitely more importance, in purifying the manners. During my abode in the country I not only never met a literary man who was a tobacco-chewer, or a whiskey-drinker, but I never met any who were not, that had escaped these degrading habits. On the women, the influence is, if possible, still more important. Unfortunately, the instances are rare, but they are to be found. One admirable example occurs in the person of a young lady of Cincinnati, surrounded by a society totally incapable of appreciating, or even of comprehending her, she holds a place among it as simply and unaffectedly as if of the same species. Young, beautiful, and gifted by nature, with a mind singularly acute and discriminating, she has happily found such opportunities of cultivation as might distinguish her in any country. It is, indeed, that best of all cultivation, which is only to be found in domestic habits of literature, and in the hourly education which the daughter of a man of letters receives, when she is made the companion and friend of her father. This young lady is the more admirable, as she contrives to unite all the multifarious duties which usually devolve upon American ladies with her intellectual pursuits. The companion and efficient assistant of her father's literary labours, the active aid in all the household cares of her mother, the tender nurse of a delicate infant sister, the skilful artificer of her own always elegant wardrobe, ever at leisure, and ever prepared to receive with the sweetest cheerfulness her numerous acquaintance, the most animated in conversation, the most indefatigable in occupation, it was impossible to know her and study her character without feeling that such women were the glory of all lands, and could the race be multiplied, would speedily become the reformers of all the grossness and ignorance that now degrade her own. Is it to be imagined that if fifty modifications of this charming young woman were to be met at a party, the men would dare to enter it reeking with whisky, their lips blackened with tobacco, and convinced to the very centre of their hearts and souls that women were made for no other purpose than to fabricate sweetmeats and gingerbread, construct shirts, darn stockings, and become mothers of possible presidents? Assuredly not. Should the women of America ever discover what their power might be, and compare it with what it is, much improvement might be hoped for. While at Philadelphia among the handsomest, the wealthiest, and the most distinguished of the land, their comparative influence in society, with that possessed in Europe by females holding the same station, occurred forcibly to my mind. Let me be permitted to describe the day of a Philadelphian lady of the first class, and the inference I would draw from it will be better understood. It may be said that the most important feature in a woman's history is her maternity. It is so, but the object of the present observation is the social, and not the domestic influence, of woman. This lady shall be the wife of a senator and a lawyer in the highest repute and practice. She has a very handsome house, with white marble steps and door-posts, and a delicate silver knocker and door-handle. She has very handsome drawing-rooms, very handsomely furnished. There is a sideboard in one of them, but it is very handsome, and has very handsome decanters and cut-glass water-jugs upon it. She has a very handsome carriage, and a very handsome free black coachman. She is always very handsomely dressed, 
and moreover she is very handsome herself. She rises, and her first hour is spent in the scrupulously nice arrangement of her dress. She descends to her parlour, neat, stiff, and silent. Her breakfast is brought in by her free black footman. She eats her fried ham and her salt fish, and drinks her coffee in silence while her husband reads one newspaper and puts another under his elbow. Then, perhaps, she washes the cups and saucers. Her carriage is ordered at eleven. Till that hour she is employed in the pastry-room, her snow-white apron protecting her mouse-coloured silk. Twenty minutes before her carriage should appear, she retires to her chamber, as she calls it, shakes and folds up her still snow-white apron, smooths her rich dress, and with nice care sets on her elegant bonnet and all the handsome etc., then walks downstairs just at the moment that her free black coachman announces to her free black footman that the carriage waits. She steps into it and gives the word, Drive to the Dorcas Society. Her footman stays at home to clean the knives, but her coachman can trust his horses while he opens the carriage door, and his lady, not being accustomed to a hand or an arm, gets out very safely without, though one of her own is occupied by a work-basket, and the other by a large roll of all those indescribable matters which ladies take as offerings to Dorcas societies. She enters the parlour appropriated for the meeting, and finds seven other ladies very like herself, and takes her place among them. She presents her contribution, which is accepted with a gentle circular smile, and her pairings of broadcloth, her ends of ribbon, her gilt paper and her minikin pins are added to the pairings of broadcloth, the ends of ribbon, the gilt papers, and the minikin pins with which the table is already covered. She also produces from her basket three ready-made pincushions, four ink wipers, seven paper matches, and a pasteboard watch case. These are welcomed with acclamations, and the youngest lady present deposits them carefully on shelves amid a prodigious quantity of similar articles. She then produces her thimble, and asks for work. It is presented to her, and the eight ladies all stitch together for some hours. Their talk is of priests and of missions, of the profits of their last sale, of their hopes from the next, of the doubt whether your Mr. This or young Mr. That should receive the fruits of it to fit him out for Liberia of the very ugly bonnet seen at church on Sabbath morning, of the very handsome preacher who performed on Sabbath afternoon, and of the very large collection made on Sabbath evening. This lasts till three, when the carriage again appears and the lady and her basket return home. She mounts to her chamber, carefully sets aside her bonnet and its appurtenances, puts on her scalloped black silk apron, walks into the kitchen to see that all is right, then into the parlour, where, having cast a careful glance over the table prepared for dinner, she sits down, work in hand, to await her spouse. He comes, shakes hands with her, spits, and dines. The conversation is not much, and ten minutes suffices for the dinner. Fruit and toddy, the newspaper and the work-bag succeed. In the evening the gentleman, being a savant, goes to the Worcester Society, and afterwards plays a snug rubber at a neighbour's. The lady receives at tea a young missionary, and three members of the Dorcas Society, and so ends her day. For some reason or other, which English people are not very likely to understand, a great number of young married persons bored by the year, instead of going to housekeeping, as they call having an establishment of their own. Of course this statement does not include persons of large fortune, but it does include very many whose rank in society would make such a mode of life quite impossible with us. I can hardly imagine a contrivance more effectual for ensuring the insignificance of a woman than marrying her at seventeen and placing her in a boarding-house. Nor can I easily imagine a life of more uniform dullness for the lady herself, but this certainly is a matter of taste. I have heard many ladies declare that it is just quite the perfection of comfort to have nothing to fix for one's self. Yet despite these assurances, I always experienced a feeling which hovered between pity and contempt when I contemplated their mode of existence. How would a newly married English woman endure it, her head and her heart full of the one dear scheme, 
well-ordered home his dear delight to make. She must rise exactly in time to reach the boarding-table at the hour appointed for breakfast, or she will get a stiff bow from the lady president, cold coffee, and no egg. I have been sometimes greatly amused upon these occasions by watching a little scene in which the by-play had much more meaning than the words uttered. The fasting, but tardy lady, looks round the table, and having ascertained that there was no egg left, says distinctly, I will take an egg if you please. But as this is addressed to no one in particular, no one in particular answers it, unless it happened that her husband is at table before her, and then he says, There are no eggs, my dear. Whereupon the lady president evidently cannot hear, and the greedy culprit who has swallowed two eggs, for there are always as many eggs as noses, looks pretty considerably afraid of being found out. The breakfast proceeds in sombre silence, save that sometimes a parrot, and sometimes a canary bird, ventures to utter a timid note. When it is finished, the gentlemen hurry to their occupation, and the quiet ladies mount the stairs, some to the first, some to the second, and some to the third stories, in an inverse proportion to the number of dollars paid, and ensconce themselves in their respective chambers. As to what they do there, it is not very easy to say, but I believe they clear starch a little, and iron a little, and sit in a rocking-chair, and sew a great deal. I always observed that the ladies who boarded wore more elaborately worked collars and petticoats than any one else. The plough is hardly a more blessed instrument in America than the needle. How could they live without it? But time and the needle wear through the longest morning, and happily the American morning is not very long, even though they breakfast at eight. It is generally about two o'clock that the boarding gentlemen meet the boarding ladies at dinner. Little is spoken except a whisper between the married pairs. Sometimes a sulky bottle of wine flanks the plate of one or two individuals, but it adds nothing to the mirth of the meeting, and seldom more than one glass to the good cheer of the owners. It is not then, and it is not there, that the gentlemen of the Union drink. Soon, very soon, the silent meal is done, and then, if you mount the stairs after them, you will find from the doors of the more affectionate and indulgent wives a smell of cigars steam forth, which plainly indicates the felicity of the couple within. If the gentleman be a very polite husband, he will, as soon as he has done his smoking and drinking his toddy, offer his arm to his wife as far as the corner of the street, where his store or his office is situated, and there he will leave her to turn which way she likes. As this is the hour for being full-dressed, of course she turns the way she can be the most seen. Perhaps she pays a few visits, perhaps she goes to chapel, or perhaps she enters some store where her husband deals, and ventures to order a few notions, and then she goes home again. No, not home, I will not give that name to a boarding-house. But she re-enters the cold, heartless atmosphere in which she dwells, where hospitality can never enter, and where interest takes the management instead of affection. At tea they all meet again, and a little trickery is perceptible to a nice observer in the manner of partaking the pound-cake, etc. After this, those who are happy enough to have engagements hasten to keep them. Those who have not either mount again to the solitude of their chamber, or, what appeared to me much worse, remain in the common sitting-room, in a society cemented by no tie, endeared by no connection, which choice did not bring together, and which the slightest motive would break asunder. I remarked that the gentlemen were generally obliged to go out every evening on business, and I confess the arrangement does not surprise me. It is not thus that the women can obtain that influence in society which is allowed to them in Europe, and to which both sages and men of the world have agreed in ascribing such salutary effects. It is in vain that collegiate institutes are formed for young ladies, or that academic degrees are conferred upon them. It is after marriage, and when these young attempts upon all the sciences are forgotten, that the lamentable insignificance of the American woman appears. Until this be remedied, I venture to prophesy that the tone of their drawing-rooms will not improve. Whilst I was at Philadelphia, 
A great deal of attention was excited by the situation of two criminals who had been convicted of robbing the Baltimore mail and were lying under sentence of death. The rare occurrence of capital punishment in America makes it always an event of great interest, and the approaching execution was repeatedly the subject of conversation at the boarding-table. One day a gentleman told us he had that morning been assured that one of the criminals had declared to the visiting clergyman that he was certain of being reprieved, and that nothing the clergyman could say to the contrary made any impression upon him. Day after day the same story was repeated, and commented upon a table, and it appeared that the report had been heard in so many quarters that not only was the statement received as true, but it began to be conjectured that the criminal had some ground for his hope. I learned from these daily conversations that one of the prisoners was an American, and the other an Irishman. And it was the former who was so strongly persuaded that he should not be hanged. Several of the gentlemen at table, in canvassing the subject, declared that if the one were hanged and the other spared, this hanging would be a murder, and not a legal execution. In discussing this point, it was stated that very nearly all the white men who had suffered death since the Declaration of Independence had been Irishmen. What truth there may be in this general statement, I have no means of ascertaining. All I know is that I heard it made. On this occasion, however, the Irishman was hanged, and the American was not. End of chapter 26《Chapter Twenty Seven of Domestic Manners of the Americans》by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Seven: Return to Stonington, Thunderstorm, Emigrants, Illness, Alexandria. A fortnight passed rapidly away in this great city, and doubtless there was still much left unseen when we quitted it, according to a previous arrangement, to return to our friends in Maryland. We came back by a different route, going by land from Newcastle to Frenchtown, instead of passing by the canal. We reached Baltimore in the middle of the night, but finished our repose on board the steamboat, and started for Washington at five o'clock the next morning. Our short abode amid the heat and closeness of a city made us enjoy more than ever the beautiful scenery around Stonington. The autumn, which soon advanced upon us, again clothed the woods in colours too varied and gaudy to be conceived by those who have never quitted Europe, and the stately maize, waving its flowering tassels, as the long drooping blossoms are called, made every field look like a little forest. A rainy spring had been followed by a summer of unusual heat, and towards the autumn frequent thunderstorms of terrific violence cleared the air, but at the same time frightened us almost out of our wits. On one occasion I was exposed with my children to the full fury of one of these awful visitations. We suffered considerable terror during this storm, but when we were all again safe and comfortably sheltered, we rejoiced that the accident had occurred, as it gave us the best possible opportunity of witnessing in all its glory a transatlantic thunderstorm. It was, however, great imprudence that exposed us to it, for we quitted the house and mounted a hill at a considerable distance from it, for the express purpose of watching to advantage the extraordinary aspect of the clouds. When we reached the top of the hill, half the heavens appeared hung with a heavy curtain. A sort of deep blue-black seemed to colour the very air. The blizzard screamed as with heavy wing they sought the earth. We ought, in common prudence, to have immediately retreated to the house, but the scene was too beautiful to be left. For several minutes after we reached our station, the air appeared perfectly without movement, no flash broke through the sevenfold cloud, but a flickering light was visible, darting to and fro behind it. By degrees the thunder rolled onward, nearer and nearer, till the inky cloud burst asunder, and cataracts of light came pouring from behind it. From that moment there was no interval, no pause, the lightning did not flash, there were no claps of thunder, but the heavens blazed and bellowed above and around us, till stupor took the place of terror, and we stood utterly confounded. But we were speedily aroused, for suddenly, as if from beneath our feet, a gust arose, which threatened to mix all the elements in one. Torrents of water seemed to bruise the earth by their violence, eddies of thick dust rose up to meet them, 
the fierce fires of heaven only blazed the brighter for the falling flood while the blast almost outroared the thunder but the wind was left at last the lord of all for after striking with wild force now here now there and bringing worlds of cloud together in most hostile contact it finished by clearing the wide heavens of all but a few soft straggling masses whence sprung a glorious rainbow and then retired leaving the earth to raise her half-crushed forests and we poor pygmies to call back our frighted senses and recover breath as we might during this gust it would have been impossible for us to have kept our feet we crouched down under the shelter of a heap of stones and as we informed each other looked most dismally pale many trees were brought to the earth before our eyes some torn up by the roots and some mighty stem snapped off several feet from the ground if the west indian hurricanes exceed this they must be terrible indeed the situation of mrs s s house was considered as remarkably healthy and i believe justly so for on more than one occasion persons who were suffering from fever and ague at the distance of a mile or two were perfectly restored by passing a week or fortnight at stonington but the neighbourhood of it particularly on the side bordering with the potomac was much otherwise and the mortality among the labourers on the canal was frightful i have elsewhere stated my doubts if the labouring poor of our country mend their condition by emigrating to the united states but it was not till the opportunity which a vicinity to the chesapeake and ohio canal gave me of knowing what their situation was after making the change that i became fully aware how little it was to be desired for them of the white labourers on this canal the great majority are irishmen their wages are from ten to fifteen dollars a month with a miserable lodging and a large allowance of whisky it is by means of this hateful poison that they are tempted and indeed enabled for a time to stand the broiling heat of the sun in a most noxious climate for through such close to the romantic but unwholesome potomac the line of the canal has hitherto run the situation of these poor strangers when they sink at last in the fever which sooner or later is sure to overtake them is dreadful there is a strong feeling against the irish in every part of the union but they will do twice as much work as a negro and therefore they are employed when they fall sick they may and must look with envy on the slaves around them for they are cared for they are watched and physicked as a valuable horse is watched and physicked not so the irishman he is literally thrown on one side and a newcomer takes his place details of their sufferings and unheeded death too painful to dwell upon often reached us on one occasion a farmer calling at the house told the family that a poor man apparently in a dying condition was lying beside the little brook at the distance of a quarter of a mile the spot was immediately visited by some of the family and there in truth lay a poor creature who was already past the power of speaking he was conveyed to the house and expired during the night by inquiring at the canal it was found that he was an irish labourer who having fallen sick and spent his last cent had left the stifling shanty where he lay in the desperate attempt of finding his way to washington with what hope i know not he did not appear above twenty and as i looked on his pale young face which even in death expressed suffering i thought that perhaps he had left a mother and a home to seek wealth in america i saw him buried under a group of locust trees his very name unknown to those who laid him there but the attendance of the whole family at the grave gave a sort of decency to his funeral which rarely in that country honours the poor relics of british dust but no clergyman attended no prayer was said no bell was tolled these indeed are ceremonies unthought of and in fact unattainable without much expense at such a distance from a town had the poor youth been an american he would have been laid in the earth in the same unceremonious manner but had this poor irish lad fallen sick in equal poverty and destitution among his own people he would have found a blanket to wrap his shivering limbs and a kindred hand to close his eyes the poor of great britain whom distress or a spirit of enterprise tempt to try another land ought for many reasons to repair to canada 
There they would meet cooperation and sympathy, instead of malice, hatred, and all uncharitableness. I frequently heard vehement complaints, and constantly met the same in the newspapers, of a practice stated to be very generally adopted in Britain, of sending out cargoes of parish paupers to the United States. A Baltimore paper heads some such remarks with the words, Infamous conduct, and then tells us of a cargo of aged paupers just arrived from England, adding, John Bull has squeezed the orange, and now insolently casts the skin in our faces. Such being the feeling, it will be readily believed that these unfortunates are not likely to meet much kindness or sympathy in sickness, or in suffering of any kind. If these American statements be correct, and that different parishes are induced, from an excessive population, to pay the voyage and outfit of some of their paupers across the Atlantic, why not send them to Canada? It is certain, however, that all the inquiries I could make failed to substantiate these American statements. All I could ascertain was that many English and Irish poor arrived yearly in the United States, with no other resources than what their labour furnished. This, though very different from the newspaper stories, is quite enough to direct attention to the subject. It is generally acknowledged that the suffering among our labouring classes arises from the excess of our population and it is impossible to see such a country as Canada, its extent, its fertility, its fine climate, and know that it is British ground, without feeling equal sorrow and astonishment that it has not made the means of relief. How earnestly it is to be wished that some part of that excellent feeling, which is for ever at work in England to help the distressed, could be directed systematically to the object of emigration to the Canadas, Large sums are annually raised for charitable purposes, by weekly subscriptions of one penny, were only a part of the money so obtained to be devoted to this object, hundreds of families might yearly be sent to people our own land. The religious feeling, which so naturally mixes with every charitable purpose, would there find the best field for its exertions. Where could a missionary, whether Protestant or Catholic, find a holier mission than that which sent him to comfort and instruct his countrymen in the wilderness? Or where could he reap a higher reward in this world than seeing that wilderness growing into fertile fields under the hands of his flock? I never saw so many autumn flowers as grow in the woods and sheep-walks of Maryland. A second spring seemed to clothe the fields, but with grief and shame I confess that of these precious blossoms I scarcely knew a single name. I think the Michaelmas daisy, and wonderful variety of form and colour, and the prickly pear, were almost my only acquaintance. Let no one visit America without having first studied botany. It is an amusement, as a clever friend of mine once told me, that helps one wonderfully up and down hill, and must be superlatively valuable in America, both from the plentiful lack of other amusements, and the plentiful material for enjoyment in this. Besides, if one is dying to know the name of any of these lovely strangers, it is a thousand to one against his finding any one who can tell it. The prettiest eclipse of the moon I ever saw was that of September of this year, 1830. We had been passing some hours amid the solemn scenery of the Potomac Falls, and just as we were preparing to quit it, the full moon arose above the black pines with half-hour shadow thrown across her. The effect of her rising, thus eclipsed, was more strange, more striking by far, than watching the gradual obscuration, and as I turned to look at the black chasm behind me, and saw the deadly alder and the poison vine waving darkly on the rocks around, I thought the scene wanted nothing but the figure of a palsied crone plucking the fatal branches to concoct some charm of mischief. Whether some such mega dog my steps, I know not. But many hours had not elapsed, ere I again felt the noxious influence of an American autumn. This fever, built in the eclipse, speedily brought me very low, and though it lasted not so long as that of the preceding year, I felt persuaded I should never recover from it. Though my forebodings were not verified by the event, it was declared that change of air was necessary, and it was arranged for me, for I was perfectly incapable of settling anything for myself, that I should go to Alexandria, a pretty town at the distance of about fifteen miles, 
which had the reputation of possessing a skilful physician. It was not without regret that we quitted our friends at Stonington, but the prescription proved in a great degree efficacious. A few weeks' residence in Alexandria restored my strength sufficiently to enable me to walk to a beautiful little grassy terrace, perfectly out of the town, but very near it, from whence we could watch the various craft that peopled the Potomac between Alexandria and Washington. But though gradually regaining strength, I was still far from well. All plans for winter gaiety were abandoned, and finding ourselves very well accommodated, we decided upon passing the winter where we were. It proved unusually severe. The Potomac was so completely frozen as to permit considerable traffic to be carried on by carts, crossing on the ice, from Maryland. This had not occurred before for thirty years. The distance was a mile and a quarter, and we ventured to brave the cold, and walk across this bright and slippery mirror, to make a visit on the opposite shore. The fatigue of keeping our feet was by no means inconsiderable, but we were rewarded by seeing as noble a winter landscape around us as the eye could look upon. When at length the frost gave way, the melting snow produced freshes so violent as to carry away the long bridge at Washington. Large fragments of it, with the railing still erect, came floating down amidst vast blocks of ice during many successive days, and it was curious to see the intrepidity with which the young sailors of Alexandria perilled their lives to make spoil of the timber. The solar eclipse of the 12th of February, 1831, was nearer total than any I ever saw, or ever shall see. It was completely annular at Alexandria, and the bright ring which surrounded the moon's shadow, though only eighty-one degrees in breadth, gave light sufficient to read the smallest print. The darkness was considerably lessened by the snow, which, as the day was perfectly unclouded, reflected brightly all the light that was left us. Notwithstanding the extreme cold, we passed the whole time in the open air, on a rising ground near the river. In this position many beautiful effects were perceptible. The rapid approach and change of shadows, the dusky hue of the broad Potomac that seemed to drink in the feeble light, which its snow-covered banks gave back to the air, the gradual change of every object from the colouring of bright sunshine to one sad universal tint of dingy purple, the melancholy lowing of the cattle, and the short but remarkable suspension of all labour, gave something of mystery and awe to the scene that we shall long remember. During the following months I occupied myself partly in revising my notes, and arranging these pages, and partly in making myself acquainted, as much as possible, with the literature of the country. While reading and transcribing my notes, I underwent a strict self-examination. I passed in review all I had seen, all I had felt, and scrupulously challenged every expression of disapprobation. The result was that I omitted in transcription much that I had written, as containing unnecessary details of things which had displeased me. Yet as I did so, I felt strongly that there was no exaggeration in them. But such details, though true, might be ill-natured, and I retained no more than were necessary to convey the general impressions received. While thus reviewing my notes, I discovered that many points which all scribbling travellers are expected to notice had been omitted but a few pages of miscellaneous observations will, I think, supply all that can be expected from so idle a pen. End of chapter 27「Chapter 28 of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28. American Cooking, Evening Parties, Dress, slaying, money-getting habits, tax-gatherer's notice, Indian summer, anecdote of the Duke of Saxe-Weimar. In relating all I know of America, I surely must not omit so important a feature as the cooking. There are sundry anomalies in the mode of serving even a first-rate table, but as these are altogether matters of custom, they by no means indicate either indifference or neglect in this important business and whether casters are placed on the table or on the sideboard, whether soup, 
fish patties and salad be eaten in orthodox order or not signifies but little i am hardly capable i fear of giving a very erudite critique on the subject general observations therefore must suffice the ordinary mode of living is abundant but not delicate they consume an extraordinary quantity of bacon ham and beefsteaks appear morning noon and night in eating they mix things together with the strangest incongruity imaginable i have seen eggs and oysters eaten together the sempiternal ham with apple sauce beefsteak with stewed peaches and salt fish with onions the bread is everywhere excellent, but they rarely enjoy it themselves, as they insist upon eating horrible half-baked hot rolls, both morning and evening. The butter is tolerable, but they have seldom such cream as every little dairy produces in England. In fact, the cows are very roughly kept, compared with ours. Common vegetables are abundant and very fine. I never saw sea-kale or cauliflowers, and either from the want of summer rain or the want of care, the harvest of green vegetables is much sooner over than with us. They eat the Indian corn in a great variety of forms. Sometimes it is dressed green and eaten like peas. Sometimes it is broken to pieces when dry, boiled plain, and brought to the table like rice. This dish is called hominy. The flour of it is made into at least a dozen different sorts of cakes, but in my opinion all bad. This flour, mixed in the proportion of one-third with fine wheat, makes by far the best bread I ever tasted. I never saw turbot, salmon, or fresh cod, but the rock and shad are excellent. There is a great want of skill in the composition of sauces, not only with fish, but with everything. They use very few made dishes, and I never saw any that would be approved by our savants. They have an excellent wild duck called the canvasback, which, if delicately served, would surpass the black cock. But the game is very inferior to ours. They have no hares, and I never saw a pheasant. They seldom indulge in second courses with all their ingenious temptations to the eating a second dinner. But almost every table has its dessert, invariably pronounced dessert, which is placed on the table before the cloth is removed, and consists of pastry, preserved fruits, and creams. They are extravagantly fond, to use their own phrase, of puddings, pies, and all kinds of sweets, particularly the ladies, but are by no means such connoisseurs in soups and ragouts as the gastronomes of Europe. Almost every one drinks water at table, and by a strange contradiction, in the country where hard drinking is more prevalent than in any other, there is less wine taken at dinner. Ladies rarely exceed one glass, and the great majority of females never take any. In fact, the hard drinking, so universally acknowledged, does not take place at jovial dinners, but, to speak plain English, in solitary dram drinking. Coffee is not served immediately after dinner, but makes part of the serious matter of tea drinking, which comes some hours later. Mixed dinner parties of ladies and gentlemen are very rare, and unless several foreigners at present, but little conversation passes at table. It certainly does not, in my opinion, add to the well-ordering of a dinner-table, to set the gentlemen at one end of it and the ladies at the other, but it is very rarely that you find it otherwise. Their large evening parties are supremely dull. The men sometimes play cards by themselves, but if a lady plays, it must not be for money. No écart, no chess, very little music, and that little lamentably bad. Among the blacks I heard some good voices singing in tune, but I scarcely ever heard a white American, male or female, go through an air without being out of tune before the end of it. Nor did I ever meet any trace of science in the singing I heard in society. To eat inconceivable quantities of cake, ice and pickled oysters, and to show half their revenue in silks and satins, seems to be the chief object they have in these parties. The most agreeable meetings, I was assured by all the young people, were those to which no married women are admitted. Of the truth of this statement I have not the least doubt. These exclusive meetings occur frequently, and often last to a late hour. On these occasions, I believe, they generally dance. 
At regular balls married ladies are admitted, but seldom take much part in the amusement. The refreshments are always profuse and costly, but taken in a most uncomfortable manner. I have known many private balls where everything was on the most liberal scale of expense, where the gentlemen sat down to supper in one room, while the ladies took theirs, standing in another. What we call picnics are very rare, and when attempted, do not often succeed well. The two sexes can hardly mix for the greater part of a day, without great restraint and ennui. It is quite contrary to their general habits. The favourite indulgences of the gentlemen, smoking cigars and drinking spirits, can neither be indulged in with decency, nor resigned with complacency. The ladies have strange ways of adding to their charms. They powder themselves immoderately, face, neck and arms, with pulverized starch. The effect is indescribably disagreeable by daylight, and not very favourable at any time. They are also most unhappily partial to false hair, which they wear in surprising quantities. This is the more to be lamented, as they generally have very fine hair of their own. I suspect this fashion to arise from an indolent mode of making their toilet, and from accomplished ladies' maids not being very abundant. It is less trouble to append a bunch of waving curls, here, there, and everywhere, than to keep their native tresses in perfect order. Though the expense of the ladies' dress greatly exceeds, in proportion to their general style of living, that of the ladies of Europe, it is very far, excepting in Philadelphia, from being in good taste. They do not consult the seasons in the colours or in the style of their costume. I have often shivered at seeing a young beauty picking her way through the snow with a pale rose-coloured bonnet set on the very top of her head. I know one lady whose pretty little ear was actually frost-bitten from being thus exposed. They never wear muffs or boots, and appear extremely shocked at the sight of comfortable walking shoes and cotton stockings, even when they have to step to their sleighs over ice and snow. They walk in the middle of winter with their poor little toes pinched into a miniature slipper, incapable of excluding as much moisture as might bedew a primrose. I must say, in their excuse, however, that they have, almost universally, extremely pretty feet. They do not walk well, nor, in fact, do they ever appear to advantage when in movement. I know not why this should be so, for they have abundance of French dancing-masters among them, but somehow or other it is the fact. I fancied I could often trace a mixture of affectation and of shyness in their little mincing, unsteady step and the ever-changing position of the hands. They do not dance well. Perhaps I should rather say that they do not look well when dancing. Lovely as their faces are, they cannot, in a position that exhibits the whole person, atone for the want of tournure, and for the universal defect in the formation of the bust, which is rarely full or gracefully formed. I never saw an American man walk or stand well. Notwithstanding their frequent militia drillings, they are nearly all hollow-chested and round-shouldered. Perhaps this is occasioned by no officer daring to say to a brother free-born, hold up your head, whatever the cause, the effect is very remarkable to a stranger. In stature and in physiognomy, a great majority of the population, both male and female, are strikingly handsome, but they know not how to do their own honours half as much comeliness elsewhere would produce ten times as much effect. Nothing can exceed their activity and perseverance in all kinds of speculation, handicraft, and enterprise, which promises a profitable pecuniary result. I heard an Englishman, who had been long resident in America, declare that in following, in meeting, or in overtaking in the street, on the road, or in the field, at the theatre, the coffee-house, or at home, he had never overheard Americans conversing without the word dollar being pronounced between them. Such unity of purpose, such sympathy of feeling, can, I believe, be found nowhere else, except perhaps in an ant's nest. The result is exactly what might be anticipated. This sordid object, for ever before their eyes, must inevitably produce a sordid tone of mind, and worse still, it produces a seared and blunted conscience on all questions of probity. 
I know not a more striking evidence of the low tone of morality which is generated by this universal pursuit of money than the manner in which the New England states are described by Americans. All agree in saying that they present a spectacle of industry and prosperity delightful to behold, and this is the district and the population most constantly quoted as the finest specimen of their admirable country. Yet I never met a single individual in any part of the Union who did not paint these New Englanders as sly, grinding, selfish, and tricking. The Yankees, as the New Englanders are called, will avow these qualities themselves with a complacent smile, and boast that no people on the earth can match them at overreaching in a bargain. I have heard them unblushingly relate stories of their cronies and friends, which, if believed among us, would banish the heroes from the fellowship of honest men for ever, and all this is uttered with a simplicity which sometimes led me to doubt if the speakers knew what honour and honesty meant. Yet the Americans declare that they are the most moral people upon earth. Again and again I have heard this asserted, not only in conversation and by their writings, but even from the pulpit. Such broad assumption of superior virtue demands examination, and after four years of attentive and earnest observation and inquiry, my honest conviction is that the standard of moral character in the United States is very greatly lower than in Europe. Of their religion, as it appears outwardly, I have had occasion to speak frequently. I pretend not to judge the heart, but without any uncharitable presumption, I must take permission to say that both Protestant England and Catholic France show an infinitely superior religious and moral aspect to mortal observation, both as to reverend decency of external observance, and as to the inward fruit of honest dealing between man and man. In other respects I think no one will be disappointed who visits the country, expecting to find no more than common sense might teach him to look for, namely, a vast continent, by far the greater part of which is still in the state in which nature left it, and a busy, bustling, industrious population hacking and hewing their way through it. What greatly increases the interest of this spectacle is the wonderful facility for internal commerce, furnished by the rivers, lakes, and canals, which thread the country in every direction, producing a rapidity of progress in all commercial and agricultural speculation altogether unequalled. This remarkable feature is perceptible in every part of the Union into which the fast-spreading population has hitherto found its way, and forms, I think, the most remarkable and interesting peculiarity of the country. I hardly remember a single town where vessels of some description or other may not constantly be seen in full activity. Their carriages of every kind are very unlike ours. Those belonging to private individuals seem all constructed with a view to summer use, for which they are extremely well calculated, but they are by no means comfortable in winter. The wagons and cars are built with great strength, which is indeed necessary from the roads they often have to encounter. The stage-coaches are heavier and much less comfortable than those of France. To those of England they can bear no comparison. I never saw any harness that I could call handsome, nor any equipage which, as to horses, carriage, harness, and servants, could be considered as complete. The sleighs are delightful, and constructed at so little expense that I wonder we have not all got them in England lying by, in waiting for the snow, which often remains with us long enough to permit their use. Slaying is much more generally enjoyed by night than by day, for what reason I could never discover, unless it be that no gentlemen are to be found disengaged from business in the mornings. Nothing certainly can be more agreeable than the gliding smoothly and rapidly along, deep sunk in soft firs, the moon shining with almost midday splendour, the air of crystal brightness, and the snow sparkling on every side, as if it were sprinkled with diamonds, and then the noiseless movement of the horses, so mysterious and unwanted, and the gentle tinkling of the bells you meet and carry, all help at once to soothe and excite the spirits. In short, I had not the least objection to slaying by night, I only wish to slay by day also. Almost every resident in the country has a carriage they call a carry-all, 
which name I suspect to be a corruption of the Cariole so often mentioned in the pretty Canadian story of Emily Montague. It is clumsy enough, certainly, but extremely convenient, and admirably calculated, with its thick roof and movable draperies, for every kind of summer excursion. Their steamboats, with the social arrangement somewhat improved, would be delightful as a mode of travelling, but they are very seldom employed for excursions of mere amusement, nor do I remember seeing pleasure-boats, properly so called, at any of the numerous places where they might be used with so much safety and enjoyment. How often did our homely adage recur to me, all work and no play would make Jack a dull boy. Jonathan is a very dull boy. We are by no means so gay as our lively neighbours on the other side of the channel, but compared with Americans we are whirligigs and teetotums. Every day is a holiday, and every night a festival. Perhaps if the ladies had quite their own way, a little more relaxation would be permitted, but there is one remarkable peculiarity in their manners which precludes the possibility of any dangerous outbreaking of the kind. Few ladies have any command of ready money entrusted to them. I have been a hundred times present when bills for a few dollars, perhaps for one, have been brought for payment to ladies living in perfectly easy circumstances, who have declared themselves without money, and referred the claimant to their husbands for payment. On every occasion where immediate disbursement is required, it is the same. Even in shopping for ready cash, they say, Send a bill home with the things, and my husband will give you a draft. I think it was during my stay in Washington that I was informed of a government regulation which appeared to me curious. I therefore record it here. Every deputy postmaster is required to insert in his return the title of every newspaper received at his office for distribution. This return is laid before the Secretary of State, who, perfectly knowing the political character of each newspaper, is thus enabled to feel the pulse of every limb of the monster mob. This is a well-imagined device for getting a peep at the politics of a country where newspapers make part of the daily food, but is it quite consistent with their entire freedom? I do not believe we have any such tricks to regulate the disposal of offices and appointments. I believe it was in Indiana that Mr. T. met with a printed notice relative to the payment of taxes, which I preserved as a curious sample of the manner in which the free citizens are coaxed and reasoned into obeying the laws. Look out, delinquents! Those indebted to me for taxes, fees, notes, and accounts are specially requested to call and pay the same on or before the first day of December, 1828, as no longer indulgence will be given. I have called time and time again, by advertisement and otherwise, to little effect, but now the time has come when my situation requires immediate payment from all indebted to me. It is impossible for me to pay off the amount of the duplicates of taxes and my other debts without recovering the same of those from whom it is due. I am at a loss to know the reason why those charged with taxes neglect to pay. From the negligence of many it would seem that they think the money is mine, or I have funds to discharge the taxes due to the State, and that I can wait with them until it suits their convenience to pay. The money is not mine, neither have I the funds to settle them out of the duplicate. My only resort is to collect. In doing so I should be sorry to have to resort to the authority given me by law for the recovery of the same. It should be the first object of every good citizen to pay his taxes, for it is in that way the government is supported. Why are taxes assessed unless they are collected? Depend upon it, I shall proceed to collect agreeably to law, so govern yourselves accordingly. John Spencer, Sheriff and Collector, D.C., November 20th, 1828. N.B. On Thursday, the 27th instant, a. Sinclair and George H. Dunn, Esquires, depart for Indianapolis. I wish as many as can pay to do so, to enable me to forward as much as possible, to save the twenty-one per cent that will be charged against me after the 8th of December next. J. S. The first autumn I passed in America, I was surprised to find a great and very oppressive return of heat, accompanied with a heavy mistiness in the air, 
long after the summer heats were over. When this state of the atmosphere comes on, they say, we have got to the Indian summer. On desiring to have this phrase explained, I was told that the phenomenon described as the Indian summer was occasioned by the Indians setting fire to the woods, which spread heat and smoke to a great distance but I afterwards met with the following explanation, which appears to me much more reasonable. The Indian summer is so called because at the particular period of the year in which it obtains, the Indians break up their village communities and go to the interior to prepare for their winter hunting. This season seems to mark a dividing line between the heat of summer and the cold of winter, and is, from its mildness, suited to these migrations. The cause of this heat is the slow combustion of the leaves and other vegetable matter of the boundless and interminable forests. Those who at this season of the year have penetrated these forests know all about it. To the feet the heat is quite sensible, whilst the ascending vapour warms everything it embraces, and spreading out into the wide atmosphere, fills the circuit of the heavens with its peculiar heat and smokiness. This unnatural heat sufficiently accounts for the sickliness of the American autumn. The effect of it is extremely distressing to the nerves, even when the general health continues good. To me it was infinitely more disagreeable than the glowing heat of the dog days. A short time before we arrived in America, the Duke of Saxe-Weimar made a tour of the United States. I heard many persons speak of his unaffected and amiable manners yet he could not escape the dislike which every trace of gentlemanly feeling is sure to create among the ordinary class of Americans. As an amusing instance of this, I made the following extract from a newspaper. A correspondent of the Charlestown Gazette tells an anecdote connected with the Duke of Saxe-Weimar's recent journey through our country, which we do not relect to have heard before, although some such story is told of the veritable Captain Basil Hall. The scene occurred on the route between Augusta and Milledgeville. It seems that the sagacious duke engaged three or four or more seats in the regular stage for the accommodation of himself and suite, and thought by this that he had secured the monopoly of the vehicle. Not so, however. A traveller came along and entered his name upon the book, and secured his seat by payment of the customary charges. To the duke's great surprise on entering the stage, he found our traveller comfortably housed in one of the most eligible seats, wrapped up in his fear-naught, and snoring like a buffalo. The duke, greatly irritated, called for the question of consideration. He demanded, in broken English, the cause of this gross intrusion, and insisted, in a very princely manner, though not, it seems, in very princely language, upon the incumbent vacating the seat in which he had made himself so impudently at home. But the Duke had yet to learn his first lesson of republicanism. The driver was one of those sturdy Southrons, who can always, and at a moment's warning, whip his weight in wildcats, and he as resolutely told the Duke that the traveller was as good, if not a better man than himself, and that no alteration of the existing arrangement could be permitted. Saxe Weimar became violent at this opposition, so unlike any to which his education hitherto had ever subjected him, and threatened John with the application of the bamboo. This was one of those threats which in Georgia dialect would subject a man to a rowing up Salt River, and accordingly down leaped our driver from his box, and peeling himself for the combat, he leaped about the vehicle in the most wild boar style, calling upon the prince of a five-acre patch to put his threat in execution. But he of the star refused to make up issue in the way suggested, contenting himself with assuring the enraged Southron of a complaint to His Excellency the Governor on arriving at the seat of government. This threat was almost as unlucky as the former, for it wrought the individual for whom it was intended into that species of fury which, though discriminating in its madness, is nevertheless without much limit in its violence, and he swore that the governor might go to, and for his part he would just as leave lick the governor as the duke, he'd like it no better fun than to give both duke and governor a dressing in the same breath, could do it, he had little doubt, etc., etc., 
and instigating one fist to diverge into the face of the marvelling and panic-stricken nobleman, with the other he thrust him down into a seat alongside the traveller, whose presence had been originally of such sore discomfort to his excellency, and bidding the attendants jump in with their discomfited master, he mounted his box in triumph and went on his journey. I fully believe that this brutal history would be as distasteful to the travelled and polished few who are to be found scattered through the Union as it is to me, but if they do not deem the possibility of such a scene to be a national degradation, I differ from them. The American people, speaking of the great mass, have no more idea of what constitutes the difference between this prince of a five-acre patch and themselves than a dray-horse has of estimating the points of the elegant victor of the race-course. Could the dray-horse speak, when expected to yield the daintiest stall to his graceful rival? He would say, a horse is a horse, and is it not with the same logic that the transatlantic huinum puts down all superiority with, a man is a man? The story justifies the reply of Talleyrand, when asked by Napoleon what he thought of the Americans. Sire, ce sont des fiers cochons et des cochons fiers. End of chapter 28Chapter 29 of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 29 Literature, Extracts, Fine Arts, Education. The character of the American literature is, generally speaking, pretty justly appreciated in Europe. The immense exhalation of periodical trash, which penetrates into every cot and corner of the country, and which is greedily sucked in by all ranks, is unquestionably one great cause of its inferiority. Where newspapers are the principal vehicles of the wit and wisdom of a people, the higher graces of composition can hardly be looked for. That there are many among them who can write well is most certain, but it is at least equally so that they have little encouragement to exercise the power in any manner more dignified than becoming the editor of a newspaper or a magazine. As far as I could judge, their best writers are far from being the most popular. The general taste is decidedly bad. This is obvious not only from the mass of slip-slop poured forth by the daily and weekly press, but from the inflated tone of eulogy in which their insect authors are lauded. To an American writer I should think it must be a flattering distinction to escape the admiration of the newspapers. Few persons of taste, I imagine, would like such a notice as the following, which I copied from a New York paper, where it followed the advertisement of a partnership volume of poems by a Mr. and Mrs. Brooks. But of such are their literary notices chiefly composed. The lovers of impassioned and classical numbers may promise themselves much gratification from the muse of Brooks, while the many-stringed harp of his lady, the Norna of the courier harp, which none but she can touch, has a chord for every heart. Another obvious cause of inferiority in the national literature is the very slight acquaintance with the best models of composition, which is thought necessary for persons called well-educated. There may be reason for deprecating the lavish expense of time bestowed in England on the acquirement of Latin and Greek, and it may be doubtful whether the power of composing in these languages with correctness and facility be worth all the labour it costs, but as long as letters shall be left on the earth, the utility of a perfect familiarity with the exquisite models of antiquity cannot be doubted. I think I run no risk of contradiction when I say that an extremely small proportion of the higher classes in America possess this familiar acquaintance with the classics. It is vain to suppose that translations may suffice. Noble as are the thoughts the ancients have left us, their power of expression is infinitely more important as a study to modern writers, and this no translation can furnish. Nor did it appear to me that their intimacy with modern literature was such as to assist them much in the formation of style. What they class as modern literature seems to include little beyond the English publications of the day. To speak of Chaucer, or even Spencer, as a modern, appears to them inexpressibly ridiculous. 
and all the rich and varied eloquence of Italy, from Dante to Monti, is about as much known in them as the Welsh effusions of Urian and Modred to us. Rousseau, Voltaire, Diderot, etc., were read by the old Federalists, but now they seem known more as naughty words than as great names. I am much mistaken if a hundred untravelled Americans could be found who have read Boileau or Le Fontaine. Still fewer are acquainted with that delightful host of French female writers, whose memoirs and letters sparkle in every page with unequalled felicity of style. The literature of Spain and Portugal is no better known, and as for the wits of Queen Anne's day, they are laid en masse upon a shelf in some score of very old-fashioned houses, together with Sherlock and Taylor, as much too antiquated to suit the immensely rapid progress of mind which distinguishes America. The most perfect examples of English writing, either of our own or of any former day, have assuredly not been produced by the imitation of any particular style. But the Fairy Queen would hardly have been written if the Orlando had not, nor would Milton have been the perfect poet he was had Virgil and Tasso been unknown to him. It is not that the scholar mimics in writing the phrases he has read, but that he could neither think, feel, nor express himself as he might have done, had his mental companionship been of a lower order. They are great novel readers, but the market is chiefly furnished by England. They have, however, a few very good native novels. Mr. Flint's Francis Berrien is delightful. There is a vigour and freshness in his writing that is exactly in accordance with what one looks for in the literature of a new country, and yet strange to say it is exactly what is most wanting in that of America. It appeared to me that the style of their imaginative compositions was almost always affected and inflated. Even in treating their great national subject of romance, the Indians, they are seldom either powerful or original. A few well-known general features, moral and physical, are presented over and over again in all their Indian stories, till in reading them you lose all sense of individual character. Mr. Flint's History of the Mississippi Valley is a work of great interest and information, and will, I hope, in time find its way to England, where I think it is much more likely to be appreciated than in America. Dr. Channing is a writer too well known in England to require my testimony to his great ability. As a preacher he has perhaps hardly a rival anywhere. This gentleman is a Unitarian, and I was informed by several persons well acquainted with the literary character of the country that nearly all their distinguished men were of this persuasion. Mr. Pierpoint is a very eloquent preacher and a sweet poet. His works are not so well known among us as they ought to be. Mr. Everett has written some beautiful lines, and if I may judge from the specimens of his speeches, as preserved in the volumes entitled Eloquence of the United States, I should say that he shone more as a poet than an orator. But American fame has decided otherwise. Mr. M. Flint of Louisiana has published a volume of poems which ought to be naturalized here. Mr. Halleck of New York has much facility of versification, and is greatly in fashion as a drawing-room poet, but I think he has somewhat too much respect for himself, and too little for his readers. It is, I think, Mr. Bryant, who ranks highest as the poet of the Union. This is too lofty an eminence for me to attack. Besides, I am of another parish, and therefore perhaps no very fair judge. From miscellaneous poetry I made a great many extracts, but upon returning to them for transcription I thought that ill-nature and dullness, O oh, ill-matched pair, would be more served by their insertion than in wholesome criticism. The massive Fridoniad of Dr. Emmons in forty cantos I never read, but as I did not meet a single native who had, I hope this want of poetical enterprise will be excused. They have very few native tragedies, not more than half a dozen, I believe, and those of very recent date. It would be ungenerous to fall heavily upon these. The attempt alone, nearly the most arduous a poet can make, is of itself honourable, and the success at least equal to that in any other department of literature. Mr. Paulding is a popular writer of novels. Some of his productions have been recently republished in England. Miss Sedgwick is also well known among us. 
Her Hope Leslie is a beautiful story. Mr. Washington Irving and Mr. Cooper have so decidedly chosen another field whereon to reap their laurels that it is hardly necessary to name them here. I am not, of course, competent to form any opinion of their scientific works, but some papers which I read almost accidentally appear to me to be written with great clearness and neatness of definition. It appears extraordinary that a people who loudly declare their respect for science should be entirely without observatories. Neither at their seats of learning, nor in their cities, does anything of the kind exist, nor did I in any direction hear of individuals given to the study of astronomy. I had not the pleasure of making any acquaintance with Mr. Bowditch of Boston, but I know that this gentleman ranks very high as a mathematician in the estimation of the scientific world of Europe. Jefferson's posthumous works were very generally circulated whilst I was in America. They are a mighty mass of mischief. He wrote with more perspicuity than he thought, and his hot-headed democracy has done a fearful injury to his country. Hollow and unsound as his doctrines are, they are but too palatable to a people, each individual of whom would rather derive his importance from believing that none are above him, than from the consciousness that in his station he makes part of a noble whole. The social system of Mr. Jefferson, if carried into effect, would make of mankind an unamalgamated mass of grating atoms, where the darling, I'm as good as you, would soon take place of the law and the gospel. As it is, his principles, though happily not fully put in action, have yet produced the most lamentable results. The assumption of equality, however empty, is sufficient to tincture the manners of the poor with brutal insolence, and subjects the rich to the paltry expediency of sanctioning the falsehood, however deep their conviction that it is such. It cannot, I think, be denied, that the great men of America attain to power and to fame by eternally uttering what they know to be untrue. American citizens are not equal. Did Washington feel them to be so, when his word outweighed, so happily for them, the votes of thousands? Did Franklin think that all were equal when he shouldered his way from the printing press to the cabinet? True, he looked back in high good humour, and with his kindest smile told the poor devils whom he left behind that they were all his equals but Franklin did not speak the truth, and he knew it. The great, the immortal Jefferson himself, he who, when past threescore years and ten, still taught young females to obey his nod, and so became the father of unnumbered generations of groaning slaves, what was his matin and his vesper hymn? All men are born free and equal. Did the venerable father of the gang believe it? Or did he, too, purchase his immortality? by a lie. From the five heavy volumes of The Eloquence of the United States, I made a few extracts which I give more for the sake of their political interest than for any purpose of literary criticism. Mr. Hancock, one of those venerated men who signed the Act of Independence, in speaking of England thus expresses himself, But if I was possessed of the gift of prophecy, I dare not, except by divine command, unfold the leaves on which the destiny of that once powerful kingdom is inscribed. It is impossible not to regret that Mr. Hancock should thus have let, I dare not, wait upon I would. It would have been exceedingly edifying to have known beforehand all the terrible things the Republic was about to do for us. This prophetic orator spoke the modest yet awful words above quoted nearly sixty years ago. In these latter days men are become bolder, for in a modern Fourth of July oration, Mr. Rush, without waiting, I think, for divine command, gives the following amiable portrait of the British character. In looking at Britain we see a harshness of individual character in the general view of it, which is perceived and acknowledged by all Europe, a spirit of unbecoming censure as regards all customs and institutions not their own a ferocity in some of their characteristics of national manners, pervading their very pastimes, which no other modern people are endued with a blunted sensibility to bear, a universal, self-assumed superiority, not innocently manifesting itself in speculative sentiments among themselves, but unamiably indulged when with foreigners of whatever description in their own country, 
or when they themselves are the temporary sojourners in a foreign country. A code of criminal law that forgets to feel for human frailty, that sports with human misfortune, that has shed more blood in deliberate judicial severity for two centuries past, constantly increasing, too, in its sanguinary hue, that has ever been sanctioned by the jurisprudence of any ancient or modern nation, civilized and refined like herself. The merciless whippings in her army, peculiar to herself alone, the conspicuous commission and freest acknowledgment of vice in the upper classes, the overweening distinction shown to opulence and birth, so destructive of a sound moral sentiment in the nation, so baffling to virtue. These are some of the traits that rise up to a contemplation of the inhabitants of this isle. Where is the alchemy that can extract from Captain Hall's work one thousandth part of the ill-will contained in this one passage? Yet America has resounded from shore to shore with execrations against his barbarous calumnies. But now we will listen to another tone. Let us see how Americans can praise. Mr. Everett, in a recent Fourth of July oration, speaks thus. We are authorized to assert that the era of our independence dates the establishment of the only perfect organization of government. Again, our government is in its theory perfect, and in its operation it is perfect also. Thus we have solved the great problem in human affairs. And again, a frame of government perfect in its principles has been brought down from the airy regions of Utopia, and has found a local habitation and a name in our country. Among my miscellaneous reading I got hold of an American publication giving a detailed and indeed an official account of the capture of Washington by the British in 1814. An event so long past, and of so little ultimate importance, is perhaps hardly worth alluding to, but there are some passages in the official documents which I thought very amusing. At the very moment of receiving the attack of the British on the heights of Bladensburg, there seems to have been a most curious puzzle among the American generals, as to where they were to be stationed, and what they were to do. It is stated that the British threw themselves forward in open order, advancing singly. The American general, Wyndon, goes on in his narrative to describe what followed thus. Our advanced riflemen now began to fire, and continued it for half a dozen rounds, when I observed them to run back to an orchard. They halted there, and seemed for a moment about returning to their original position, but in a few moments entirely broke and retired to the left of Stansburg's line. The advanced artillery immediately followed the riflemen. The first three or four rockets fired by the enemy were much above the heads of Stansburg's line but the rockets having taken a more horizontal direction, a universal flight of the centre and left of this brigade was the consequence. The 5th Regiment and the artillery still remained, and I hoped would prevent the enemy's approach. But they, advancing singly, their fire annoyed the 5th considerably, when I ordered it to retire, to put it out of the reach of the enemy. This order was, however, immediately countermanded, from an aversion to retire before the necessity became stronger and from a hope that the enemy would issue in a body, and enable us to act upon him on terms of equality. But the enemy's fire, beginning to annoy the fifth still more, by wounding several of them, and a strong column passing up the road and deploying on its left, I ordered them to retire. Their retreat became a flight of absolute and total disorder. Of Beale's regiment the general gives the following succinct account. It gave one or two ineffectual fires, and fled. In another place he says, piteously, the cavalry would do anything but charge. General Armstrong's gentle and metaphysical account of the business was that, without all doubt the determining cause of our disasters is to be found in the love of life. This affair at Washington, which in its result was certainly advantageous to America, inasmuch as it caused the present beautiful capital to be built in the place of the one we burnt, was nevertheless considered as a national calamity at the time. In a volume of miscellaneous poems I met with one, written with the patriotic purpose of cheering the country under it. One triplet struck me as rather alarming for us, however soothing to America. 
Supposing George's house at Kew were burnt as we intend to do, would that be burning England too? I think I have before mentioned that no work of mere pleasantry has hitherto been found to answer, but a recent attempt of the kind has been made, with what success cannot as yet be decided. The editors are comedians belonging to the Boston Company, and it is entitled The American Comic Annual. It is accompanied by etching, somewhat in the manner, but by no means with the spirit of Cruikshanks. Among the pleasantries of this lively volume are some biting attacks upon us, particularly upon our utter incapacity of speaking English. We really must engage a few American professors, or we shall lose all trace of classic purity in our language. As a specimen, and rather a favourable one, of the work, I transcribed an extract from a little piece entitled, Sayings and Doings, a Fragment of a Farce. One of the personages of this farce is an English gentleman, a Captain Mandeville, and among many speeches of the same kind I selected the following. Collins's Ode is the subject of conversation. Ah, 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 it strikes me that you mention his the hode about hanger and ope and aura and revenge, you know. I've erred Mrs. Sitdown's henkord in it at Common Garden, and Dury Lane in the ite of her popularity, you know. By the boy, hall the haction in America is wery orrid. You're honly in the infancy of the istrionic heart, you know. Your performers never haspirate the h in sich vords, for instance, as hink and hoats, and leave out the w in weiss, wanity, you know and make nothing of homitten the k in something. There is much more in the same style, but perhaps this may suffice. I have given this passage chiefly because it affords an example of the manner in which the generality of Americans are accustomed to speak of English pronunciation and phraseology. It must be remembered, however, here and everywhere, that this phrase, the Americans, does not include the instructed and travelled portion of the community. It would be absurd to swell my little volumes with extracts in proof of the veracity of their contents, but having spoken of the taste of their lighter works, and also of the general tone of manners, I cannot forbear inserting a page from an American annual, the token, which purports to give a scene from fashionable life. It is part of a dialogue between a young lady of the highest standing, and her tutor, who is moreover her lover, though not yet acknowledged. "'And so you won't tell me,' said she, "'what has come over you, and why you look as grave and sensible as a dictionary, when by general consent even mine, Motley's the only wear?' "'Am I so grave, Miss Blair?' "'Are you so grave, Miss Blair? One would think I had not got my lesson to-day. Pray, sir, has the black ox trod upon your toe since we parted?' Philip tried to laugh, but he did not succeed. He bit his lip, and was silent. "'I am under orders to entertain you, Mr. Blondell, and if my poor brain can be made to gird this fairy isle, I shall certainly be obedient. So I begin with playing the leech. What ails you, sir?' "'Miss Blair,' he was going to remonstrate. "'Miss Blair? Now pity. I'm a quack. For whip me if I know whether Miss Blair is a fever or an ague.' How did you catch it, sir? Really, Miss Blair? Nay, I would see you don't like doctoring. I give over, and now I'll be sensible. It's a fine day, Mr. Blondell. Very. A pleasant lane, this, to walk in, if one's company were agreeable. Does Mr. Skefton stay long? asked Philip abruptly. No one knows. Indeed, are you so ignorant? And why does your wisdom ask that question? In no society in the world can the advantage of travel be so conspicuous as in America. In other countries a tone of unpretending simplicity can more than compensate for the absence of enlarged views or accurate observation. But this tone is not to be found in America, or if it be, it is only among those who, having looked at that insignificant portion of the world not included in the Union, have learnt to know how much is still unknown within the mighty part which is. For the rest they all declare, and do in truth believe, that they only, among the sons of men, have wit and wisdom, and that one of their exclusive privileges is that of speaking English elegantly. 
There are two reasons for this latter persuasion. The one is that the great majority have never heard any English but their own, except from the very lowest of the Irish, and the other that those who have chanced to find themselves in the society of the few educated English who have visited America have discovered that there is a marked difference between their phrases and accents and those to which they have been accustomed, whereupon they have, of course, decided that no Englishman can speak English. The Reviews of America contain some good, clear-headed articles, but I sought in vain for the playful vivacity and the keenly cutting satire, whose sharp edge, however painful to the patient, is of such high utility in lopping off the excrescences of bad taste and levelling to its native clay the heavy growth of dullness. Still less could I find any trace of that graceful familiarity of learned illusion and general knowledge which mark the best European reviews, and which make one feel in such perfectly good company while perusing them. But this is a tone not to be found either in the writings or conversation of Americans. As distant from pedantry as from ignorance, it is not learning itself, but the effect of it, and so pervading and subtle is its influence that it may be traced in the festive halls and gay drawing-rooms of Europe as certainly as in the cloistered library or student's closet. It is, perhaps, the last finish of highly finished society. A late American quarterly has an article on a work of Dr. von Schmidt Fizzeldeck, from which I made an extract as a curious sample of the dreams they love to batten on. Dr. von Fizzeldeck, not fiddlestick, who is not only a doctor of philosophy, but a knight of Donnebrog to boot, has never been in America, but he has written a prophecy showing that the United States must and will govern the whole world, because they are so very big and have so much uncultivated territory. He prophesies that a union will take place between North and South America, which will give a death-blow to Europe at no distant period, though he modestly adds that he does not pretend to designate the precise period at which this will take place. This Danish prophecy, as may be imagined, enchants the reviewer. He exhorts all people to read Dr. Fizzeldeck's book, because nothing but good can come of such contemplations of the future, and because it is eminently calculated to awaken the most lofty anticipations of the destiny which awaits them, and will serve to impress upon the nation the necessity of being prepared for such high destiny. In another place the reviewer bursts out, America, young as she is, has become already the beacon, the patriarch of the struggling nations of the world, and afterwards adds, it would be departing from the natural order of things, and the ordinary operations of the great scheme of providence, it would be shutting our ears to the voice of experience, and our eyes to the inevitable connection of causes and their effects, were we to reject the extreme probability, not to say moral certainty, that the old world is destined to receive its influences in future from the new. There are twenty pages of this article, but I will only give one passage more. It is an instance of the sort of reasoning by which American citizens persuade themselves that the glory of Europe is, in reality, her reproach. Wrapped up in a sense of its superiority, the European reclines at home, shining in his borrowed plumes, derived from the produce of every corner of the earth, and the industry of every portion of its inhabitants, with which his own natural resources would never have invested him. He continues revelling in enjoyments which nature has denied him. The American quarterly deservedly holds the highest place in their periodical literature, and therefore may be fairly quoted as striking the keynote for the chorus of public opinion. Surely it is nationality rather than patriotism which leads it thus to speak in scorn of the successful efforts of enlightened nations to win from every corner of the earth the riches which nature has scattered over it. The incorrectness of the press is very great. They make strange work in the reprints of French and Italian, and the Latin, I suspect, does not fare much better. I believe they do not often meddle with Greek. With regard to the fine arts, their paintings, I think, are quite as good, or rather better than might be expected from the patronage they receive. 
The wonder is that any man can be found with courage enough to devote himself to a profession in which he has so little chance of finding a maintenance. The trade of a carpenter opens an infinitely better prospect, and this is so well known that nothing but a genuine passion for the art could beguile any one to pursue it. The entire absence of every means of improvement and effectual study is unquestionably the cause why those who manifest this devotion cannot advance farther. I heard of one young artist whose circumstances did not permit his going to Europe, but who, being nevertheless determined that his studies should, as nearly as possible, resemble those of the European academies, was about to commence drawing the human figure, for which purpose he had provided himself with a thin silk dress in which to clothe his models, as no one of any station, he said, could be found who would submit to sit as a model without clothing. It was at Alexandria that I saw what I consider as the best picture by an American artist that I met with. The subject was Hagar and Ishmael. It had recently arrived from Rome, where the painter, a young man of the name of Chapman, had been studying for three years. His mother told me that he was twenty-two years of age, and passionately devoted to the art. Should he, on returning to his country, receive sufficient encouragement to keep his ardour and his industry alive? I think I shall hear of him again. Much is said about the universal diffusion of education in America, and a vast deal of genuine admiration is felt and expressed at the progress of mind throughout the Union. They believe themselves, in all sincerity, to have surpassed, to be surpassing, and to be about to surpass the whole earth and the intellectual race. I am aware that not a single word can be said hinting a different opinion, which will not bring down a transatlantic anathema on my head, yet the subject is too interesting to be omitted. Before I left England I remember listening with much admiration to an eloquent friend, who deprecated our system of public education, as confining the various and excursive faculties of our children to one beaten path, paying little or no attention to the peculiar powers of the individual. This objection is extremely plausible, but doubts of its intrinsic value must, I think, occur to every one who has marked the result of a different system throughout the United States. From every inquiry I could make, and I took much pains to obtain accurate information, it appeared that much is attempted, but very little beyond reading, writing, and bookkeeping is thoroughly acquired. Were we to read a prospectus of the system pursued in any of our public schools, and that of a first-rate seminary in America, we should be struck by the confined scholastic routine of the former, when compared to the varied and expansive scope of the latter. But let the examination go a little farther, and I believe it will be found that the old-fashioned school discipline of England has produced something higher and deeper, too, than that which roars so loud and thunders in the index. They will not afford to let their young men study till two or three and twenty, and it is therefore declared, ex cathedra americana, to be unnecessary. At sixteen, often much earlier, education ends and money-making begins. The idea that more learning is necessary than can be acquired by that time is generally ridiculed as obsolete monkish bigotry. Added to which, if the seniors willed a more prolonged discipline, the juniors would refuse submission. When the money-getting begins, leisure ceases, and all the lore which can be acquired afterwards is picked up from novels, magazines, and newspapers. At what time can the taste be formed? How can a correct and polished style, even of speaking, be acquired? Or when can the fruit of the two thousand years of past thinking be added to the native growth of American intellect? These are the tools, if I may so express myself, which our elaborate system of school discipline puts into the hands of our scholars. Possessed of these, they may use them in whatever direction they please afterwards. They can never be an encumbrance. No people appear more anxious to excite admiration and receive applause than the Americans, yet none take so little trouble or make so few sacrifices to obtain it. This may answer among themselves, but it will not with the rest of the world. Individual sacrifices must be made, and national economy enlarged, before America can compete with the old world in taste, learning, and liberality. The reception of General Lafayette 
is the one single instance in which the national pride has overcome the national thrift, and this was clearly referable to the one single feeling of enthusiasm of which they appear capable, namely the triumph of their successful struggle for national independence. But though this feeling will be universally acknowledged as a worthy and lawful source of triumph and of pride, it will not serve to trade upon for ever as a fund of glory and high station among the nations. Their fathers were colonists, they fought stoutly and became an independent people. Success and admiration, even the admiration of those whose yoke they had broken, cheered them while living, still sheds a glory round their remote and untitled sepulchres, and will illumine the page of their history for ever. To doubt that talent and mental power of every kind exist in America would be absurd. Why should it not? But in taste and learning they are woefully deficient, and it is this which renders them incapable of graduating a scale by which to measure themselves. Hence arises that overweening complacency and self-esteem, both national and individual, which at once renders them so extremely obnoxious to ridicule, and so peculiarly restive under it. If they will scorn the process by which other nations have become what they avowedly intend to be, they must rest satisfied with the praise and admiration they receive from each other, and turning a deaf ear to the criticism of the old world, consent to be their own prodigious great reward. Alexandria has its churches, chapels, and conventicles as abundantly in proportion to its size as any city in the Union. I visited most of them and in the Episcopal and Catholic heard the services performed quietly and reverently. The best sermon, however, that I listened to was in a Methodist church, from the mouth of a Pequot Indian. It was impossible not to be touched by the simple sincerity of this poor man. He gave a picture frightfully eloquent of the decay of his people under the united influence of the avarice and intemperance of the white men. He described the effect of the religious feeling which had recently found its way among them as most salutary. The purity of his moral feeling, and the sincerity of his sympathy with his forest brethren, made it unquestionable that he must be the most valuable priest who could officiate for them. His English was very correct, and his pronunciation but slightly tinctured by native accent. While we were still in the neighborhood of Washington, a most violent and unprecedented schism occurred in the cabinet. The four secretaries of state all resigned, leaving General Jackson to manage the queer little state barge alone. Innumerable contradictory statements appeared upon this occasion in the papers, and many a cigar was thrown aside ere half consumed, that the disinterested politician might give breath to his cogitations on this extraordinary event but not all the eloquence of all the smokers, nor even the ultra-diplomatic expositions which appeared from the seceding secretaries themselves, could throw any light on the mysterious business. It produced, however, the only tolerable caricature I ever saw in the country. It represents the President seated alone in his cabinet, wearing a look of much discomfiture, and making great exertions to detain one of four rats, who are running off by placing his foot on the tail. The rats' heads bear a very sufficient resemblance to the four ex-ministers. General Jackson, it seems, had requested Mr. Van Buren, the Secretary of State, to remain in office till his place was supplied. This gave occasion to a bon mot from his son, who, being asked when his father would be in New York, replied, When the President takes off his foot. End of chapter 29《Chapter Thirty of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Thirty Journey to New York, Delaware River, Stage Coach, City of New York, Collegiate Institute for Young Ladies, Theatres, Public Garden, Churches, Morris Canal, Fashions, Carriages. At length, in spite of the lingering pace necessarily attending consultations and arrangements across the Atlantic, our plans were finally settled. The coming spring was to show us New York and Niagara, and the early summer was to convey us home. No sooner did the letter arrive which decided this than we began our preparations for departure. 
We took our last voyage on the Potomac, we bade a last farewell to Virginia, and gave a last day to some of our kind friends near Washington. The spring, though slow and backward, was sufficiently advanced to render the journey pleasant, and though the road from Washington to Baltimore was less brilliant in foliage than when I had seen it before, it still had much of beauty. The azaleas were in full bloom, and the delicate yellow blossom of the sassafras almost rivalled its fruit in beauty. At Baltimore we again embarked on a gigantic steamboat, and reached Philadelphia in the middle of the night. Here we changed our boat and found time, before starting in the morning, to take a last look at the Doric and Corinthian porticoes of the two celebrated temples dedicated to Mammon. The Delaware River above Philadelphia still flows through a landscape too level for beauty, but it is rendered interesting by a succession of gentlemen's seats, which, if less elaborately finished in architecture and garden grounds than the lovely villas on the Thames, are still beautiful objects to gaze upon as you float rapidly past on the broad silvery stream that washes their lawns. They present a picture of wealth and enjoyment that accords well with the noble city to which they are an appendage. One mansion arrested our attention, not only from its being more than usually large and splendid, but from its having the monument which marked the family resting-place, rearing itself in all the gloomy grandeur of black and white marble, exactly opposite the door of entrance. In Virginia and Maryland we had remarked that almost every family mansion had its little graveyard, sheltered by locust and cypress trees, but this decorated dwelling of the dead seemed rather a melancholy ornament in the grounds. We had for a considerable distance a view of the dwelling of Joseph Bonaparte, which is situated on the New Jersey shore, in the midst of an extensive tract of land of which he is the proprietor. Here the ex-monarch has built several houses, which are occupied by French tenants. The country is very flat, but a terrace of two sides has been raised, commanding a fine reach of the Delaware River. At the point where this terrace forms a right angle, a lofty chapel has been erected, which looks very much like an observatory. I admired the ingenuity with which the Catholic prince has united his religion and his love of a fine terrestrial prospect. The highest part of the building presents, in every direction, the appearance of an immense cross, the transept, if I may so express it, being formed by the projection of an ample balcony which surrounds a tower. A Quaker gentleman from Philadelphia exclaimed, as he gazed on the mansion, There we see a monument of fallen royalty. Strange that dethroned kings should seek and find their best stronghold in a republic. There was more of philosophy than of scorn in his accent, and his countenance was the symbol of gentleness and benevolence. But I overheard many unquakerlike jokes from others, as to the comfortable assurance a would-be king must feel of a faithful alliance between his head and shoulders. At Trenton, the capital of New Jersey, we left our smoothly gliding comfortable boat for the most detestable stage-coach that ever Christian built to dislocate the joints of his fellow-men. Ten of these torturing machines were crammed full of the passengers who left the boat with us. The change in our movement was not more remarkable than that which took place in the tempers and countenances of our fellow-travellers. Gentlemen who had lounged on sofas, and balanced themselves in chairs all the way from Philadelphia, with all the conscious fascinations of stiff stays and neckcloths, which, while doing to death the rash beauties who ventured to gaze, seemed but a whalebone panoply to guard the wearer, these pretty youths so guarded from without, so sweetly at peace within, now crushed beneath their armour, looked more like victims on the wheel than dandies armed for conquest. Their whalebones seemed to enter into their souls, and every face grew grim and scowling. The pretty ladies, too, with their expansive bonnets, any one of which might handsomely have filled the space allotted to three, how sad the change! I almost fancied they must have been of the race of Undine, and it was only when they heard the splashing of water that they could smile. As I looked into the altered eyes of my companions, I was tempted to ask, Look I as cross as you? Indeed, I believe that if possible, I looked crosser still, 
for the roads and the vehicle together were quite too much for my philosophy. At length, however, we found ourselves alive on board the boat which was to convey us down the Raritan River to New York. We fully intended to have gone to bed to heal our bones on entering the steamboat, but the sight of a table neatly spread determined us to go to dinner instead. Sin and shame would it have been indeed to have closed our eyes upon the scene which soon opened before us. I have never seen the Bay of Naples, I can therefore make no comparison, but my imagination is incapable of conceiving anything of the kind more beautiful than the harbour of New York. Various and lovely are the objects which meet the eye on every side, but the naming them would only be to give a list of words, without conveying the faintest idea of the scene. I doubt if ever the pencil of Turner could do it justice, bright and glorious as it rose upon us. We seemed to enter the harbour of New York upon waves of liquid gold, and as we darted past the green isles which rise from its bosom, like guardian sentinels of the fair city, the setting sun stretched his horizontal beams farther and farther at each moment, as if to point out to us some new glory in the landscape. New York, indeed, appeared to us, even when we saw it by a soberer light, a lovely and a noble city. To us, who had been so long travelling through half-cleared forests, and sojourning among an I'm-as-good-as-you population, it seemed perhaps more beautiful, more splendid, and more refined than it might have done had we arrived there directly from London. But making every allowance for this, I must still declare that I think New York one of the finest cities I ever saw, and as much superior to every other in the Union, Philadelphia not excepted, as London to Liverpool or Paris to Rouen. Its advantages of position are perhaps unequalled anywhere, Situated on an island which I think it will one day cover, it rises like Venice from the sea, and like that fairest of cities in the days of her glory, receives into its lap tribute of all the riches of the earth. The southern point of Manhattan Island divides the waters of the harbour into the north and east rivers. On this point stands the city of New York, extending from river to river, and running northward to the extent of three or four miles. I think it covers nearly as much ground as Paris, but is much less thickly peopled. The extreme point is fortified towards the sea by a battery, and forms an admirable point of defence I should suppose no city could boast. From hence commences the splendid Broadway, as the fine avenue is called, which runs through the whole city. This noble street may vie with any I ever saw, for its length and breadth, its handsome shops, neat awnings, excellent trottoir, and well-dressed pedestrians. It has not the crowded glitter of Bond Street equipages, nor the gorgeous fronted palaces of Regent Street, but it is magnificent in its extent, and ornamented by several handsome buildings, some of them surrounded by grass and trees. The park, in which stands the noble city hall, is a very fine area. I never found that the most graphic description of a city could give me any feeling of being there, and even if others have the power, I am very sure I have not, of setting churches and squares and long-drawn streets before the mind's eye. I will not, therefore, attempt a detailed description of this great metropolis of the New World, but will only say that during the seven weeks we stayed there we always found something new to see and to admire and were it not so very far from all the old-world things which cling about the heart of a European, I should say that I never saw a city more desirable as a residence. The dwelling-houses of the higher classes are extremely handsome and very richly furnished. Silk or satin furniture is as often or oftener seen than chintz. The mirrors are as handsome as in London, the chiffoniers, slabs, and marble tables as elegant, and in addition they have all the pretty tasteful decoration of French porcelaine, and ormolu in much greater abundance, because at a much cheaper rate. Every part of their houses is well carpeted, and the exterior finishing, such as steps, railings, and door-frames, are very superior. Almost every house has handsome green blinds on the outside. Balconies are not very general, 
nor do the houses display externally so many flowers as those of paris and london but i saw many rooms decorated within exactly like those of a european petite maîtresse little tables looking and smelling like flower-beds portfolios knick-knacks bronzes busts cameos and alabaster vases illustrated copies of ladylike rhymes bound in silk and in short all the pretty coxcomalities of the drawing-room scattered about with the same profuse and studied negligence as with us hudson square and its neighbourhood is i believe the most fashionable part of the town the square is beautiful excellently well planted with a great variety of trees and only wanting our frequent and careful mowing to make it equal to any square in london the iron railing which surrounds this enclosure is as high and as handsome as that of the tuileries and it will give some idea of the care bestowed on its decoration to know that the gravel for the walks was conveyed by barges from boston not as ballast but as freight the great defect in the houses is their extreme uniformity when you have seen one you have seen all neither do i quite like the arrangement of the rooms in nearly all the houses the dining and drawing-rooms are on the same floor with ample folding doors between them when thrown together they certainly make a very noble apartment but no doors can be barrier sufficient between dining and drawing-rooms mixed dinner parties of ladies and gentlemen however are very rare which is a great defect in the society not only as depriving them of the most social and hospitable manner of meeting but as leading to frequent dinner parties of gentlemen without ladies which certainly does not conduce to refinement the evening parties excepting such as are expressly for young people are chiefly conversational we were too late in the season for large parties but we saw enough to convince us that there is society to be met with in new york which would be deemed delightful anywhere cards are very seldom used and music from their having very little professional aid at their parties is seldom i believe as good as what is heard at private concerts in london the americans have certainly not the same besoin of being amused as other people they may be the wiser for this perhaps but it makes them less agreeable to a looker-on there are three theatres at new york all of which we visited the park theatre is the only one licensed by fashion but the bowery is infinitely superior in beauty it is indeed as pretty a theatre as i ever entered perfect as to size and proportion elegantly decorated and the scenery and machinery equal to any in london but it is not the fashion the chatham is so utterly condemned by bon ton that it requires some courage to decide upon going there nor do I think my curiosity would have penetrated so far, had I not seen Miss Mitford's Rienzi advertised there. It was the first opportunity I had had of seeing it played, and spite of very indifferent acting, I was delighted. The interest must have been great, for till the curtain fell, I saw not one quarter of the queer things around me. Then I observed in the front row of a dress-box a lady performing the most maternal office possible several gentlemen without their coats and a general air of contempt for the decencies of life certainly more than usually revolting at the park theatre i again saw the american rosius mr forrest he played the part of damon and roared i thought very unlike a nightingale i cannot admire this celebrated performer another night we saw cinderella there mrs austin was the prima donna and much admired the piece was extremely well got up and on this occasion we saw the park theatre to advantage for it was filled with well-dressed company but still we saw many yet unrazored lips polluted with the grim tinge of the hateful tobacco and heard without ceasing the spitting which of course is its consequence if their theatres had the orchestra of the phaedo and a choir of angels to boot i could find but little pleasure so long as they were followed by this running accompaniment of thorough bass whilst at new york the prospectus of a fashionable boarding-school was presented to me i made some extracts from it as a specimen of the enlarged scale of instruction proposed for young females brooklyn collegiate institute for young ladies brooklyn heights opposite the city of new york 
Junior Department. Sixth Class. Latin Grammar, Liber Primus. Jacob's Latin Reader, First Part. Modern Geography, Intellectual and Practical Arithmetic Finished. Dr. Barber's Grammar of Elocution, Writing, Spelling, Composition, and Vocal Music. Fifth Class. Jacob's Latin Reader, Second Part. Roman Antiquities, Sallust. Clark's Introduction to the Making of Latin, Ancient and Sacred Geography, Studies of Poetry, Short Treatise on Rhetoric, Map Drawing, Composition, Spelling, and Vocal Music. Fourth Class. Caesar's Commentaries, First Five Books of Virgil's Aeneid, Mythology, Watts on the Mind, Political Geography, Woodbridge's Large Work, Natural History, Treatise on the Globes, Ancient History, Studies of Poetry Concluded, English Grammar, Composition, Spelling, and Vocal Music. Senior Department. Third Class. Virgil, Finished. Cicero's Select Orations, Modern History, Plain Geometry, Moral Philosophy, Critical Reading of Young's Poems, Perspective Drawing, Rhetoric, Logic, Composition, and Vocal Music. Second Class. Livy, Horace, Odes, Natural Theology, Small Compend of Ecclesiastical History, Female Biography, Algebra, Natural Philosophy, Mechanics, Hydrostatics, Pneumatics, and Acoustics, Intellectual Philosophy, Evidences of Christianity, Composition, and Vocal Music. First Class. Horace, Finished, Tacitus, Natural Philosophy, Electricity, Optics, Magnetism, Galvanism, Astronomy, Chemistry, Mineralogy, and Geology, Compend of Political Economy, Composition, and Vocal Music. The French, Spanish, Italian, or Greek languages may be attended to, if required, at any time. The exchange is very handsome and ranks about midway between the heavy gloom that hangs over our London merchants and the light and lofty elegance which decorates the Bourse at Paris. The churches are plain, but very neat, and kept in perfect repair within and without, but I saw none which had the least pretension to splendor. The Catholic Cathedral at Baltimore is the only church in America which has. At New York, as everywhere else, they show within, during the time of service, like beds of tulips, so gay, so bright, so beautiful, are the long rows of French bonnets and pretty faces rows but rarely broken by the unribboned heads of the male population the proportion is about the same as i have remarked elsewhere excepting at new york i never saw the other side of the picture but there i did on the opposite side of the north river about three miles higher up is a place called hoboken a gentleman who possessed a handsome mansion and grounds there also possessed the right of ferry and to render this productive he has restricted his pleasure-grounds to a few beautiful acres, laying out the remainder simply and tastefully as a public walk. It is hardly possible to imagine one of greater attraction, a broad belt of light underwood and flowering shrubs, studded at intervals with lofty forest trees, runs for two miles along a cliff which overhangs the matchless Hudson. Sometimes it feathers the rocks down to its very margin, and at others leaves a pebbly shore just rude enough to break the gentle waves, and make a music which mimics softly the loud chorus of the ocean. Through this beautiful little wood, a broad, well-graveled terrace is led by every point which can exhibit the scenery to advantage. Narrow and wilder paths diverge at intervals, some into the deeper shadow of the wood, and some shelving gradually to the pretty coves below. The price of entrance to this little Eden is the six cents you pay at the ferry. We went there on a bright Sunday afternoon, expressly to see the humours of the place. Many thousand persons were scattered through the grounds. Of these we ascertained, by repeatedly counting, that nineteen twentieths were men. The ladies were at church. Often, as the subject has pressed upon my mind, I think I never so strongly felt the conviction that the Sabbath day, the holy day, the day on which alone the great majority of the Christian world can spend their hours as they please, is ill passed, if passed entirely, within brick walls, listening to an earth-born preacher, 
charm he never so wisely. Oh, how can they renounce the boundless store of charms which nature to her votaries yields? The warbling woodland, the resounding shore, the pomp of groves and garniture of fields, all that the genial ray of morning gilds, and all that echoes to the song of even, all that the mountain's sheltering bosom yields, and all the dread magnificence of heaven, oh, how can they renounce and hope to be forgiven? How is it that the men of America, who are reckoned good husbands and good fathers, while they themselves enjoy sufficient freedom of spirit to permit their walking forth into the temple of the living God, can leave those they love best on earth bound in the iron chains of a most tyrannical fanaticism? How can they breathe the balmy air, and not think of the tainted atmosphere so heavily weighing upon the breasts still dearer than their own? How can they gaze upon the blossoms of the spring, and not remember the fairer cheeks of their young daughters, waxing pale, as they sit for long sultry hours, immured with hundreds of fellow-victims, listening to the roaring vanities of a preacher canonized by a college of old women? They cannot think it needful to salvation, or they would not withdraw themselves. Wherefore is it? Do they fear these self-elected, self-ordained priests, and offer up their wives and daughters to propitiate them? Or do they deem their hebdomadal freedom more complete, because their wives and daughters are shut up four or five times in the day at church or chapel? It is true that at Hoboken, as everywhere else, there are reposoirs which, as you pass them, blast the sense for a moment by reeking forth the fumes of whisky and tobacco, and it may be that these cannot be entered with a wife or daughter. The proprietor of the grounds, however, has contrived with great taste to render these abominations not unpleasing to the eye. There is one in particular which has quite the air of a Grecian temple, and did they drink wine instead of whisky, it might be inscribed to Bacchus. But in this particular, as in many others, the ancient and modern republics differ. It is impossible not to feel, after passing one Sunday in the churches and chapels of New York, and the next in the gardens of Hoboken, that the thousands of well-dressed men you see enjoying themselves at the latter, have made over the thousands of well-dressed women you saw exhibited at the former, into the hands of the priests, at least for the day. The American people arrogate to themselves a character of superior morality and religion, but this division of their hours of leisure does not give me a favourable idea of either. I visited all the exhibitions in New York. The Medici of the Republic must exert themselves a little more before these can become even respectable. The worst of the business is that, with the exception of about half a dozen individuals, the good citizens are more than contented, they are delighted. The newspaper lungs of the Republic breathe forth praise and triumph, nay, almost pant with ecstasy, in speaking of their native chef dœuvre I should be hardly believed were I to relate the instances which fell in my way of the utter ignorance respecting pictures to be found among persons of the first standing in society. Often where a liberal spirit exists, and a wish to patronize the fine arts is expressed, it is joined to a profundity of ignorance on the subject almost inconceivable. A doubt as to the excellence of their artists is very nervously received, and one gentleman, with much civility, told me that at the present era all the world were aware that competition was pretty well at an end between our two nations, and that a little envy might naturally be expected to mix with the surprise with which the mother country beheld the distance at which her colonies were leaving her behind. I must, however, do the few artists with whom I became acquainted, the justice to say that their own pretensions are much more modest than those of their patrons for them. I have heard several confess and deplore their ignorance of drawing, and have repeatedly remarked a sensibility to the merit of European artists, though perhaps only known by engravings, and a deference to their authority, which showed a genuine feeling for the art. In fact, I think that there is a very considerable degree of natural talent for painting in America, but it has to make its way through darkness and thick night. When an academy is founded, their first care is to hang the walls of its exhibition room with all the unutterable trash that is offered to them. 
no living models are sought for, no discipline as to the manner of study is enforced. Boys who know no more of the human form than they do of the eyes, nose, and mouth in the moon begin painting portraits. If some of them would only throw away their palettes for a year and learn to draw, if they would attend anatomical lectures and take notes, not in words but in forms, of joints and muscles, their exhibitions would soon cease to be so utterly below criticism. The most interesting exhibition open when I was there was, decidedly, Colonel Trumbull's, and how the patriots of America can permit this truly national collection to remain a profitless burden on the hands of the artist, it is difficult to understand. Many of the sketches are masterly, but like his illustrious countryman, West, his sketches are his chef-d'oeuvre. I can imagine nothing more perfect than the interior of the public institutions of New York. There is a practical good sense in all their arrangements that must strike foreigners very forcibly. The Asylum for the Destitute offers a hint worth taking. It is dedicated to the reformation of youthful offenders of both sexes, and it is as admirable in the details of its management as in its object. Every part of the institution is deeply interesting, but there is a difference very remarkable between the boys and the girls. The boys are, I think, the finest set of lads I ever saw brought together, bright-looking, gay, active, and full of intelligence. The girls are exactly in reverse, heavy, listless, indifferent, and melancholy. In conversing with the gentleman who is the general superintendent of the establishment, I made the remark to him, and he told me, that the reality corresponded with the appearance. All of them had been detected in some act of dishonesty, but the boys, when removed from evil influence which had led them so to use their ingenuity, rose like a spring when a pressure is withdrawn, and feeling themselves once more safe from danger and from shame, hope and cheerfulness animated every countenance. But the poor girls, on the contrary, can hardly look up again. They are as different as an oak and a lily after a storm. The one, when the fresh breeze blows over it, shakes the raindrops from its crest, and only looks the brighter. The other, its silken leaves once soiled, shrinks from the eye, and is levelled to the earth for ever. We spent a delightful day in New Jersey, in visiting with the most agreeable party, the inclined plains which are used instead of locks on the Morris Canal. This is a very interesting work. It is one among a thousand which prove the people of America to be the most enterprising in the world. I was informed that this important canal, which connects the waters of the Hudson and the Delaware, is a hundred miles long, and in this distance overcomes a variation of level amounting to sixteen hundred feet. Of this, fourteen hundred are achieved by inclined planes. The planes average about sixty feet of perpendicular lift each, and are to support about forty tons. The time consumed in passing them is twelve minutes for one hundred feet of perpendicular rise. The expense is less than a third of what locks would be for surmounting the same rise. If we set about any more canals, this may be worth attending to. This Morris Canal is certainly an extraordinary work. It not only varies its level sixteen hundred feet, but at one point runs along the side of a mountain at thirty feet above the tops of the highest buildings in the town of Patterson below. At another, it crosses the falls of the Passaic in a stone aqueduct sixty feet above the water in the river. This noble work, in a great degree, owes its existence to the patriotic and scientific energy of Mr. Cadwallader Colden. There is no point in the national character of the Americans which commands so much respect as the boldness and energy with which public works are undertaken and carried through. Nothing stops them if a profitable result can be fairly hoped for. It is this which has made cities spring up amidst the forests with such inconceivable rapidity, and could they once be thoroughly persuaded that any point of the ocean had a hoard of dollars beneath it, I have not the slightest doubt that in about eighteen months we should see a snug-covered railroad leading direct to the spot. I was told at New York that in many parts of the state it was usual to pay the service of the Presbyterian ministers in the following manner. Once a year a day is fixed on which some member of every family in a congregation meet at their minister's house in the afternoon. 
They each bring an offering, according to their means, of articles necessary for housekeeping. The poorer members leave their contributions in a large basket, placed for the purpose close to the door of the entrance. Those of more importance, and more calculated to do honour to the piety of the donors, are carried into the room where the company is assembled. Sugar, coffee, tea, cheese, barrels of flour, pieces of Irish linen, sets of china and glass, were among the articles mentioned to me as usually making parts of these offerings. After the party is assembled, and the business of giving and receiving is dispatched, tea, coffee, and cakes are handed round, but these are not furnished at any expense either of trouble or money to the minister, for selected ladies of the congregation take the whole arrangement upon themselves. These meetings are called spinning visits. Another New York custom, which does not seem to have so reasonable a cause, is the changing house once a year. On the first of May the city of New York has the appearance of sending off a population flying from the plague, or of a town which had surrendered on condition of carrying away all their goods and chattels. Rich furniture and ragged furniture, carts, wagons and drays, ropes, canvas and straw, packers, porters and draymen, white, yellow and black, occupy the streets from east to west, from north to south on this day. Every one I spoke to on the subject complained of this custom as most annoying, but all assured me it was unavoidable if you inhabit a rented house. More than one of my New York friends have built or bought houses solely to avoid this annual inconvenience. There are a great number of Negroes in New York, all free, their emancipation having been completed in 1827. Not even in Philadelphia, where the anti-slavery opinions have been the most active and violent, do the blacks appear to wear an air of so much consequence as they do at New York. They have several chapels in which Negro ministers officiate, and a theatre in which none but Negroes perform. At this theatre a gallery is appropriated to such whites as choose to visit it, and here only are they permitted to sit. Following in this, with nice etiquette and equal justice, the arrangement of the white theatres, in all of which is a gallery appropriated solely to the use of the blacks. I have often, particularly on a Sunday morning, met groups of negroes elegantly dressed, and have been sometimes amused by observing the very superior air of gallantry assumed by the men when in attendance on their bells to that of whites in similar circumstances. On one occasion we met in Broadway a young negress in the extreme of fashion, and accompanied by a black beau whose toilet was equally studied. Eyeglass, guard chain, nothing was omitted. He walked beside his sable goddess uncovered, and with an air of the most tender devotion. At the window of a handsome house which they were passing stood a very pretty white girl, with two gentlemen beside her, but alas, both of them had their hats on, and one was smoking. If it were not for the peculiar manner of walking, which distinguishes all American women, Broadway might be taken for a French street, where it was the fashion for very smart ladies to promenade. The dress is entirely French. Not an article, except perhaps the cotton stockings, must be English, on pain of being stigmatized as out of the fashion. Everything English is decidedly mauvais ton. English materials, English fashions, English accent, English manner, are all terms of reproach, and to say that an unfortunate looks like an English woman is the cruelest satire which can be uttered. I remember visiting France almost immediately after we had made the most offensive invasion of her territory that can well be imagined, yet despite the feelings which lengthened years of war must have engendered, it was the fashion to admire everything English. I suppose family quarrels are most difficult to adjust, for fifteen years of peace have not been enough to calm the angry feelings of brother Jonathan towards the land of his fathers, the which he hateth passing well. It is hardly needful to say that the most courteous amenity of manner distinguishes the reception given to foreigners by the patrician class of Americans. Gentlemen, in the old world sense of the term, are the same everywhere and an American gentleman and his family know how to do the honours of their country to strangers of every nation, as well as any people on earth. But this class, though it decidedly exists, is a very small one, 
and cannot in justice be represented as affording a specimen of the whole. Most of the houses in New York are painted on the outside, but in a manner carefully to avoid disfiguring the material which it preserves. On the contrary, nothing can be neater. They are now using a great deal of a beautiful stone called Jersey Freestone. It is of a rich, warm brown, and extremely ornamental to the city, wherever it has been employed. They have also a grey granite of great beauty. The trottoir paving in most of the streets is extremely good, being of large flagstones, very superior to the bricks of Philadelphia. At night the shops, which are open till very late, are brilliantly illuminated with gas, and all the population seem as much alive as in London or Paris. This makes the solemn stillness of the evening hours in Philadelphia still more remarkable. There are a few trees in different parts of the city, and I observed young ones planted and guarded with much care. Were they more abundant, it would be extremely agreeable, for the reflected light of their fierce summer sheds intolerable day. Ice is in profuse abundance. I do not imagine that there is a house in the city without the luxury of a piece of ice to cool the water and harden the butter. The hackney coaches are the best in the world, but abominably dear and it is necessary to be on the qui vive in making your bargain with the driver. If you do not, he has the power of charging immoderately. On my first experiment I neglected this, and was asked two dollars and a half for an excursion of twenty minutes. When I referred to the waiter of the hotel, he asked if I had made a bargain. No. Then I expect, with the usual look of triumph, that the Yankee has been too smart for you. The private carriages of New York are infinitely handsomer and better appointed than any I saw elsewhere. The want of smart liveries destroys much of the gay effect, but on the whole a New York summer equipage, with the pretty women and beautiful children it contains, look extremely well in Broadway, and would not be much amiss anywhere. The luxury of the New York aristocracy is not confined to the city. Hardly an acre of Manhattan Island but shows some pretty villa or stately mansion. The most chosen of these are on the north and east rivers, to whose margins their lawns descend. Among these, perhaps, the loveliest is one situated in the beautiful village of Bloomingdale. Here, within the space of sixteen acres, almost every variety of garden scenery may be found. To describe all its diversity of hill and dale, of wood and lawn, of rock and river, would be in vain. Nor can I convey an idea of it by comparison, for I never saw anything like it. How far the elegant hospitality which reigns there may influence my impression, I know not. But assuredly no spot I have ever seen dwells more freshly on my memory, nor did I ever find myself in a circle more calculated to give delight in meeting and regret at parting than that of Woodlawn. End of chapter 30「Chapter thirty one of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty one Reception of Captain Basil Hall's Book in the United States. Having now arrived nearly at the end of our travels, I am induced, ere I conclude, again to mention what I consider as one of the most remarkable traits in the national character of the Americans namely, their exquisite sensitiveness and soreness, respecting everything said or written concerning them. Of this, perhaps, the most remarkable example I can give, is the effect produced on nearly every class of readers by the appearance of Captain Basil Hall's Travels in North America. In fact, it was a sort of moral earthquake, and the vibration it occasioned through the nerves of the Republic, from one corner of the Union to the other, was by no means over when I left the country in July 1831, a couple of years after the shock. I was in Cincinnati when these volumes came out, but it was not till July 1830 that I procured a copy of them. One bookseller to whom I applied told me that he had had a few copies before he understood the nature of the work, but that after becoming acquainted with it nothing should induce him to sell another. Other persons of his profession must, however, have been less scrupulous, for the book was read in city, town, village, and hamlet, 
steamboat and stagecoach, and a sort of war-hoop was sent forth perfectly unprecedented in my recollection upon any occasion whatever. It was fortunate for me that I did not procure these volumes till I had heard them very generally spoken of, for the curiosity I felt to know the contents of a work so violently anathematized led me to make inquiries which elicited a great deal of curious feeling. An ardent desire for approbation, and delicate sensitiveness under censure, have always, I believe, been considered as amiable traits of character, but the condition into which the appearance of Captain Hall's work through the Republic shows plainly that these feelings, if carried to excess, produce a weakness which amounts to imbecility. It was perfectly astonishing to hear men, who on other subjects were sane of judgment, utter their opinions upon this. I never heard of any instance in which the common sense generally found in national criticism was so overthrown by passion. I do not speak of the want of justice, and of fair and liberal interpretation. These perhaps were hardly to be expected. Other nations have been called thin-skinned, but the citizens of the Union have apparently no skins at all. They wince if a breeze blows over them, unless it be tempered with adulation. It was not, therefore, very surprising that the acute and forcible observations of a traveller they knew would be listened to should be received testily. The extraordinary features of the business were, first, the excess of the rage into which they lashed themselves, and, secondly, the puerility of the inventions by which they attempted to account for the severity with which they fancied they had been treated. Not content with declaring that the volumes contained no word of truth from beginning to end, which is an assertion I heard made very nearly as often as they were mentioned, the whole country set to work to discover the causes why Captain Hall had visited the United States, and why he had published his book. I have heard it said with as much precision and gravity, as if the statement had been conveyed by an official report, that Captain Hall had been sent out by the British government expressly for the purpose of checking the growing admiration of England for the government of the United States, that it was by a commission from the Treasury he had come, and that it was only in obedience to orders that he had found anything to object to. I do not give this as the gossip of a coterie. I am persuaded that it is the belief of a very considerable portion of the country. So deep is the conviction of this singular people, that they cannot be seen without being admired, that they will not admit the possibility that any one should honestly and sincerely find aught to disapprove in them, or their country. At Philadelphia I met with a little anonymous book, written to show that Captain Basil Hall was in no way to be depended on, for that he not only slandered the Americans, but was himself, in other respects, a person of very equivocal morals. One proof of this is given by a quotation of the following playful account of the distress occasioned by the want of a bell. The commentator calls it an instance of shocking coarseness. One day I was rather late for breakfast, and as there was no water in my jug, I set off post-haste, half-shaved, half-dressed, and more than half-vexed, in quest of water, like a seaman on short allowance, hunting for rivulets on some unknown coast. I went upstairs and downstairs, and in the course of my researches into half a dozen different apartments, might have stumbled on some lady's chamber, as the song says, which, considering the plight I was in, would have been awkward enough. Another indication of this moral coarseness is pointed out in the passage where Captain Hall says he never saw a flirtation all the time he was in the Union. The charge of ingratitude also was echoed from mouth to mouth. That he should himself bear testimony to the unvarying kindness of the reception he met with, and yet find fault with the country, was declared on all hands to be a proof of the most abominable ingratitude that had ever entered into the heart of man to conceive. I once ventured before about a dozen people to ask whether more blame would not attach to an author if he suffered himself to be bribed by individual kindness to falsify facts than if, despite all personal considerations, he stated them truly? "'Facts!' cried the whole circle at once. "'Facts! I tell you, there is not one word of fact in it from beginning to end.' The American reviews are, many of them, I believe, well known in England. 
I need not therefore quote them here, but I sometimes wondered whether they, none of them, ever thought of translating Obadiah's curse into classic American. If they had done so, only placing, he, Basil Hall, between brackets instead of, he, Obadiah, it would have saved them a world of trouble. I can hardly describe the curiosity with which I sat down at length to pursue these tremendous volumes. Still less can I do justice to my surprise at their contents. To say that I found not one exaggerated statement throughout the work is by no means saying enough. It is impossible for any one who knows the country not to see that Captain Hall earnestly sought out things to admire and commend. When he praises, it is with evident pleasure, and when he finds fault, it is with evident reluctance and restraint, excepting where motives purely patriotic urge him to state roundly what it is for the benefit of his country should be known. In fact, Captain Hall saw the country to the greatest possible advantage. Furnished, of course, with letters of introduction to the most distinguished individuals, and with the still more influential recommendation of his own reputation, he was received in full drawing-room style and state from one end of the Union to the other. He saw the country in full dress, and had little or no opportunity of judging it unhouseled, disappointed, unannealed, with all its imperfections on its head, as I and my family too often had. Captain Hall had certainly excellent opportunities of making himself acquainted with the form of the government and the laws, and of receiving, moreover, the best oral commentary upon them, in conversation with the most distinguished citizens. Of these opportunities he made excellent use. Nothing important met his eye which did not receive that sort of analytical attention which an experienced and philosophical traveller alone can give. This has made his volumes highly interesting and valuable, but I am deeply persuaded that were a man of equal penetration to visit the United States with no other means of becoming acquainted with the national character than the ordinary working-day intercourse of life, he would conceive an infinitely lower idea of the moral atmosphere of the country than Captain Hall appears to have done and the internal conviction on my mind is strong that if captain hall had not placed a firm restraint on himself he must have given expression to far deeper indignation than any he has uttered against many points in the american character with which he shows from other circumstances that he was well acquainted his rule appears to have been to state just so much of the truth as would leave on the minds of his readers a correct impression at the least cost of pain to the sensitive folks he was writing about. He states his own opinions and feelings, and leaves it to be inferred that he has good grounds for adopting them, but he spares the Americans the bitterness which a detail of the circumstances would have produced. If any one chooses to say that some wicked antipathy to twelve millions of strangers is the origin of my opinion, I must bear it, and were the question one of mere idle speculation, I certainly would not court the abuse I must meet for stating it. But it is not so. I know that among the best, the most pious, the most benevolent of my countrymen, there are hundreds, nay, I fear thousands, who conscientiously believe that a greater degree of political and religious liberty, such as is possessed in America, would be beneficial for us. How often I have wished, during my abode in the United States, that one of these conscientious but mistaken reasoners, fully possessed of his country's confidence, could pass a few years in the United States, sufficiently among the mass of citizens to know them, and sufficiently at leisure to trace effects to their causes. Then might we look for a statement which would teach these mistaken philanthropists to tremble at every symptom of democratic power among us, a statement which would make even our sectarians shudder at the thought of hewing down the established church, for they would be taught, by fearful example, to know that it was the bulwark which protects us from the gloomy horrors of fanatic superstition on one side, and the still more dreadful inroads of infidelity on the other. And more than all, such a man would see as clear as light, that where every class is occupied in getting money, and no class in spending it, there will neither be leisure for worshipping the theory of honesty, nor motive strong enough to put its restrictive doctrine in practice. Where every man is engaged in driving hard bargains with his fellows, 
where is the honoured class to be found into which gentlemanlike feelings principles and practice are necessary as an introduction that there are men of powerful intellect benevolent hearts and high moral feeling in america i know and i could if challenged to do so name individuals surpassed by none of any country in these qualities but they are excellent despite their institutions not in consequence of them it is not by such that captain hall's statements are called slanders nor is it from such that i shall meet the abuse which i well know these pages will inevitably draw upon me and i only trust i may be able to muster as much self-denial as my predecessor who asserts in his recently published fragments that he has read none of the american criticisms on his book he did wisely if he wished to retain an atom of his kindly feeling toward america and he has assuredly lost but little on the score of information for these criticisms generally speaking consist of mere downright personal abuse or querulous complaints of his ingratitude and ill usage of them complaints which it is quite astonishing that any persons of spirit could indulge in the following good-humoured paragraphs from the fragments must i think rather puzzle the americans possibly they may think that captain hall is quizzing them when he says he has read none of their criticisms but i think there is in these passages internal evidence that he has not seen them for if he had read one fiftieth part of the vituperation of his travels which it has been my misfortune to peruse he could hardly have brought himself to write what follows if the americans still refuse to shake the hand proffered to them in the true old john bull spirit they are worse folks than even i take them for captain hall after describing the hospitable reception he formerly met with at a boarding-house in new york goes on thus if our hostess be still alive i hope she will not repent of having bestowed her obliging attentions on one who so many years afterwards made himself he fears less popular in her land than he could wish to be amongst a people to whom he owes so much and for whom he really feels so much kindness he still anxiously hopes however they will believe him when he declares that having said in his recent publication no more than what he conceived was due to strict truth and to the integrity of history as far as his observations and opinions went he still feels as he always has and ever must continue to feel towards america the heartiest good will the americans are perpetually repeating the foundation stone of their liberty is fixed on the doctrine that every man is free to form his own opinions and to promulgate them in candour and in moderation is it meant that a foreigner is excluded from these privileges if not may i ask in what respect have i passed these limitations the americans have surely no fair right to be offended because my views differ from theirs and yet i am told i have been rudely handled by the press of that country if my motives are distrusted i can only say i am sorely belied if i am mistaken regret at my political blindness was surely more dignified than anger on the part of those with whom i differ and if it shall chance that i am in the right the best confirmation of the correctness of my views in the opinion of indifferent persons will perhaps be found in the soreness of those who wince when the truth is spoken yet after all few things would give me more real pleasure than to know that my friends across the water would consent to take me at my word and considering what i have said about them as so much public matter which it truly is agree to reckon me in my absence and they always did when i was amongst them and i am sure they would count me if i went back again as a private friend i differed with them in politics and i differ with them now as much as ever but i sincerely wish them happiness individually and as a nation i shall rejoice if they prosper as the persians write what can i say more and i only hope that these few words may help to make my peace with people who justly pride themselves on bearing no malice as for myself i have no peace to make for i have studiously avoided reading any of the american criticisms on my book in order that the kindly feelings i have ever entertained towards that country should not be ruffled by this abstinence i may have lost some information and perhaps missed many opportunities of correcting erroneous impressions but i set so much store by the pleasing recollection of the journey itself 
and of the hospitality with which my family were everywhere received, that whether it be right or whether it be wrong, I cannot bring myself to read anything which might disturb these agreeable associations. So let us part in peace, or rather let us meet again in cordial communication, and if this little work shall find its way across the Atlantic, I hope it will be read there without reference to anything that has passed between us, or, at all events, with reference only to those parts of our former intercourse which are satisfactory to all parties. Hall's Fragments, Volume 1, page 200. I really think it is impossible to read not only this little passage, but many others in these delightful little volumes, without feeling that their author is as little likely to deserve the imputation of harshness and ill-will as any man that ever lived. In reading Captain Hall's volumes on America, the observation which I think struck me the most forcibly, and which certainly came the most completely home to my own feelings, was the following. In all my travels, both amongst the heathens and amongst Christians, I have never encountered any people by whom I found it nearly so difficult to make myself understood as by the Americans. I have conversed in London and in Paris with foreigners of many nations, and often through the misty medium of an idiom imperfectly understood, but I remember no instance in which I found the same difficulty in conveying my sentiments, my impressions, and my opinions to those around me as I did in America. Whatever faith may be given to my assertion, no one who has not visited the country can possibly conceive to what extent it is true. It is less necessary, I imagine, for the mutual understanding of persons conversing together, that the language should be the same, than that their ordinary mode of thinking and habits of life should in some degree assimilate, whereas in point of fact there is hardly a single point of sympathy between the Americans and us. But whatever the cause, the fact is certainly, as I have stated it, and herein, I think, rests the only apology for the preposterous and undignified anger felt and expressed against Captain Hall's work. They really cannot, even if they wished it, enter into any of his views, or comprehend his most ordinary feelings, and therefore they cannot believe in the sincerity of the impressions he describes. The candour which he expresses, and evidently feels, they mistake for irony, or totally distrust. His unwillingness to give pain to persons from whom he has received kindness, they scornfully reject his affectation, and although they must know right well in their own hearts, how infinitely more they lay at his mercy than he has chosen to betray, they pretend, even to themselves, that he has exaggerated the bad points of their character and institutions, whereas the truth is that he has let them off with a degree of tenderness which may be quite suitable for him to exercise, however little merited, while at the same time he has most industriously magnified their merits whenever he could possibly find anything favourable. One can perfectly well understand why Captain Hall's avowed Tory principles should be disapproved of in the United States, especially as, with a questionable policy and a bookselling point of view in these reforming times, he volunteers a profession of political faith in which, to use the Kentucky phrase, he goes the whole hog, and bluntly avows in his concluding chapter that he not only holds stoutly to church and state, but that he conceives the English House of Commons to be, if not quite perfect, at least as much so for all the required purposes of representation as it can by possibility be made in practice. Such a downright thoroughgoing Tory and anti-reformer, pretending to judge of the workings of the American democratical system, was naturally held to be a monstrous abomination, and it has been visited accordingly both in America and, as I understand, with us also. The experience which Captain Hall has acquired in visits to every part of the world during twenty or thirty years goes for nothing with the radicals on either side of the Atlantic. On the contrary, precisely in proportion to the value of that authority which is the result of actual observation, are they irritated to find its weight cast into the opposite scale. Had not Captain Hall been converted by what he saw in North America, from the Whig faith he exhibited in his description of South America, his book would have been far more popular in England during the last two years of public excitement. 
It may perhaps be long before any justice is done to Captain Hall's book in the United States, but a less time will probably suffice to establish its claim to attention at home. End of chapter 31《Chapter Thirty Two of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty Two Journey to Niagara, Hudson, West Point, Hyde Park, Albany, Yankees, Trenton Falls, Rochester, Genesee Falls, Lockport. How quickly weeks glide away in such a city as New York! especially when you reckon among your friends some of the most agreeable people in either hemisphere. But we had still a long journey before us, and one of the wonders of the world was to be seen. On the 30th of May we set off for Niagara. I had heard so much of the surpassing beauty of the North River that I expected to be disappointed, and to find reality flat after description. But it is not in the power of man to paint with a strength exceeding that of nature in such scenes as the Hudson presents. Every mile shows some new and startling effect of the combination of rocks, trees, and water. There is no interval of flat or insipid scenery from the moment you enter upon the river at New York to that of quitting it at Albany, a distance of a hundred and eighty miles. For the first twenty miles the shore of New Jersey on the left offers an almost continued wall of trap-rock, which from its perpendicular form and lineal fissures is called the Palisades. This wall sometimes rises to the height of a hundred and fifty feet, and sometimes sinks down to twenty. Here and there a watercourse breaks its uniformity, and everywhere the brightest foliage in all the splendour of the climate and the season fringed and chequered the dark barrier. On the opposite shore, Manhattan Island, with its leafly coronet gemmed with villas, forms a lovely contrast to these rocky heights. After passing Manhattan Island, the eastern shore gradually assumes a wild and rocky character, but ever varying. Woods, lawns, pastures, and towering cliffs all meet the eye in quick succession as the giant steamboat cleaves its swift passage up the stream. For several miles the voyage is one of great interest, independent of its beauty, for it passes many points where important events of the Revolutionary War took place. It was not without a pang that I looked on the spot where poor André was taken, and another where he was executed. Several forts, generally placed in most commanding situations, still show by their battered ruins where the struggle was strongest, and I felt no lack of that moral interest so entirely wanting in the new states, and without which no journey can, I think, continue long without wearying the spirits. About forty miles from New York you enter upon the highlands, as a series of mountains which then flank the river on both sides are called. The beauty of this scenery can only be conceived when it is seen. One might fancy that these capricious masses, with all their countless varieties of light and shade, were thrown together to show how passing lovely rocks and woods and water could be. Sometimes a lofty peak shoots suddenly up into the heavens, showing in bold relief against the sky, and then a deep ravine sinks in solemn shadow, and draws the imagination into its leafy recesses. For several miles the river appears to form a succession of lakes. You are often enclosed on all sides by rocks rising directly from the very edge of the stream, and then you turn a point, the river widens, and again woods, lawns, and villages are reflected on its bosom. The state prison of Sing Sing is upon the edge of the water, and has no picturesque effect to atone for the painful images it suggests. The sleepy hollow of Washington Irving, just above it, restores the imagination to a better tone. West Point, the military academy of the United States, is fifty miles from New York. The scenery around it is magnificent, and though the buildings of the establishment are constructed with the handsome and unpicturesque regularity which marks the work of governments, they are so nobly placed and so embosomed in woods that they look beautiful. The lengthened notes of a French horn, which I presume was attending some of their military manoeuvres, sounded with deep and solemn sweetness as we passed. About thirty miles further is Hyde Park, 
the magnificent seat of Dr. Hosack. Here the misty summit of the distant Catskill begins to form the outline of the landscape. It is hardly possible to imagine anything more beautiful than this place. We passed a day there with great enjoyment, and the following morning set forward again in one of those grand floating hotels called steamboats. Either on this day or the one before, we had two hundred cabin passengers on board, and they all sat down together to a table spread abundantly and with considerable elegance. A continual succession of gentlemen seats, many of them extremely handsome, borders the river to Albany. We arrived there late in the evening, but had no difficulty in finding excellent accommodation. Albany is the state capital of New York, and has some very handsome public buildings. There are also some curious relics of the old Dutch inhabitants. The first sixteen miles from Albany we travelled in a stage, to avoid a multitude of locks at the entrance of the Erie Canal, but at Schenectady we got on board one of the canal packet-boats for Utica. With a very delightful party, of one's own choosing, fine temperate weather, and a strong breeze to chase the mosquitoes, this mode of travelling might be very agreeable, but I can hardly imagine any motive of convenience powerful enough to induce me again to imprison myself in a canal-boat under ordinary circumstances. The accommodations being greatly restricted, everybody, from the moment of entering the boat, acts upon a system of unshrinking egotism. The library of a dozen books, the backgammon board, the tiny berths, the shady side of the cabin, are all jostled for in a manner to make one greatly envy the power of the snail. At the moment I would willingly have given up some of my human dignity for the privilege of creeping into a shell of my own. To any one who has been accustomed to travelling, to be addressed with, Do sit here, you will find it more comfortable, the, You must go there, I made for this place first, sounds very unmusical. There is a great quietness about the women of America. I speak of the exterior manner of persons casually met but somehow or other I should never call it gentleness. In such trying moments as that of fixing themselves on board a packet-boat, the men are prompt, determined, and will compromise anybody's convenience except their own. The women are doggedly steadfast in their will, until matters are settled, look like hedgehogs, with every quill raised and firmly set, as if to forbid the approach of any one who might wish to rub them down. In circumstances where an English woman would look proud, and a French woman nonchalante, an American lady looks grim, even the youngest and the prettiest can set their lips, and knit their brows, and look as hard as unsocial as their grandmothers. Though not in the Yankee or New England country, we were bordering upon it sufficiently to meet in the stages and boats many delightful specimens of this most peculiar race. I like them extremely well, but I would not wish to have any business transactions with them, if I could avoid it, lest, to use their own phrase, they should be too smart for me. It is by no means rare to meet elsewhere, in this working-day world of ours, people who push acuteness to the verge of honesty, and sometimes perhaps a little beyond. But I believe the Yankee is the only one who will be found to boast of doing so. It is by no means easy to give a clear and just idea of a Yankee. If you hear his character from a Virginian, you will believe him a devil. If you listen to it from himself, you might fancy him a god, though a tricky one, Mercury turned righteous and notable. Matthews did very well, as far as I expect, I calculate, and I guess. But this is only the shell. There is an immense deal within, both of sweet and bitter. In acuteness, cautiousness, industry, and perseverance, he resembles the Scotch. In habits of frugal neatness, he resembles the Dutch. In love of lucre, he doth greatly resemble the sons of Abraham, but in frank admission and superlative admiration of all his own peculiarities, he is like nothing on earth but himself. The Quakers have been celebrated for the pertinacity with which they avoid giving a direct answer, but what Quaker could ever vie with the Yankee in this sort of fencing? Nothing, in fact, can equal their skill in evading a question excepting that with which they set about asking one. I am afraid that in repeating a conversation which I overheard on board the Erie canal-boat, 
I shall spoil it by forgetting some of the little delicate doublings which delighted me, yet I wrote it down immediately. Both parties were Yankees, but strangers to each other one of them having, by gentle degrees, made himself pretty well acquainted with the point from which every one on board had started, and that for which he was bound, at last attacked his brother Reynard thus. "'Well, now, which way may you be travelling? "'I expect this canal runs pretty nearly west. "'Are you going far with it? "'Well, now, I don't rightly know how many miles it may be. "'I expect you'll be from New York?' Sure enough, I have been at New York, often and often. I calculate, then, tis not there as you stop? Business must be minded in stopping and stirring. You may say that. Well, I look, then, you'll be making for the springs? Folks say as all the world is making for the springs, and I accept a good sight of them is. Do you calculate upon stopping long when you get to your journey's end? Tis my business must settle that, I expect. I guess that's true, too. But you'll be for making pleasure a business for once, I calculate. My business don't often lie in that line. Then, maybe, it is not the Springs as takes you this line? The Springs is a right elegant place, I reckon. It is your health, I calculate, as makes you break your good rules? My health don't trouble me much, I guess. No? Why, that's well. How is the market, sir? Are breadstuffs up? I ain't just capable to say. A deal of money's made by just looking after the article at the fountain's head. You may say that. Do you look to be making great dealings in produce up the country? Why, that, I expect, is difficult to know. I calculate you'll find the markets changeable these times. No markets beant very often without changing. Why, that's right down true. What may be your biggest article of produce? I calculate generally that's the biggest as I makes most by. You may say that, but what do you chiefly call your most particular branch? Why, that's what I can't justly say. And so they went on without advancing or giving an inch, till I was weary of listening, but I left them still at it, when I stepped out to resume my station on a trunk at the bow of the boat, where I scribbled in my notebook this specimen of Yankee conversation. The Erie Canal is cut through much solid rock, and we often passed between magnificent cliffs. The little falls of the Mohawk form a lovely scene. The rocks over which the river runs are most fantastic in form. The fall continues nearly a mile, and a beautiful village called the Little Falls overhangs it. As many locks occur at this point, we quitted the boat that we might the better enjoy the scenery, which is of the widest description. Several other passengers did so likewise and I was much amused by one of our Yankees, who very civilly accompanied our party, pointing out to me the wild state of the country, and apologizing for it by saying that the property all round thereabouts had been owned by an Englishman. And you'll excuse me, ma'am, but when the English gets a spot of wild ground like this here, they have no notions about it like us. But the Englishmen have sold it, and if you was to see it five years hence, you would not know it again. I'll engage there will be by that half a score of elegant factories. Tis a true shame to let such a privilege of water lie idle. We reached Utica at twelve o'clock the following day, pretty well fagged by the sun by day, and a crowded cabin by night. Lemon juice and iced water, without sugar, kept us alive. But for this delightful recipe, feather fans and eau de cologne, I think we should have failed altogether. The thermometer stood at ninety degrees. At two we set off in a very pleasant airy carriage for Trenton Falls, a delightful drive of fourteen miles. These falls have become within the last few years only second in fame to Niagara. The West Canada Creek, which in the map shows but as a paltry stream, has found its way through three miles of rock, which at many points is a hundred and fifty feet high. A forest of enormous cedars is on their summit and many of that beautiful species of white cedar which droops its branches like the weeping willow grow in the clefts of the rock and in some places almost dip their dark foliage in the torrent the rock is of a dark grey limestone and often presents a wall of unbroken surface near the hotel a flight of very alarming steps leads down to the bed of the stream and on reaching it you find yourself enclosed in a deep abyss of solid rock 
with no visible opening but that above your head. The torrent dashes by with inconceivable rapidity. Its colour is black as night, and the dark ledge of rock on which you stand is so treacherously level with it that nothing warns you of danger. Within the last three years, two young people, though surrounded by their friends, have stepped an inch too far, and disappeared from among them, as if by magic, never to revisit earth again. This broad, flat ledge reached but a short distance, and then the perpendicular wall appears to stop your farther progress. But there is a spirit of defiance in the mind of man. He will not be stayed either by rocks or waves. By the aid of gunpowder, a sufficient quantity of the rock has been removed to afford a fearful footing round a point, which, when doubled, discloses a world of cataracts, all leaping forward together in most magnificent confusion. I suffered considerably before I reached the spot where this grand scene is visible. A chain, firmly fastened to the rock, serves to hang by, as you creep along the giddy verge, and this enabled me to proceed so far but here the chain failed, and my courage with it, though the rest of the party continued for some way farther, and reported largely of still increasing sublimity. But my knees tottered, and my head swam, so while the rest crept onward, I sat down to wait their return on the floor of the rock which had received us on quitting the steps. A hundred and fifty feet of bare black rock on one side, an equal height covered with solemn cedars on the other, an unfathomed torrent roaring between them, the fresh remembrance of the ghastly legend belonging to the spot, and the idea of my children clinging to the dizzy path I had left, was altogether sombre enough, but I had not sat long, before a tremendous burst of thunder shook the air. The deep chasm answered from either side, again, again, and again. I thought the rock I sat upon trembled, but the whole effect was so exceedingly grand, that I had no longer leisure to think of my fear. My children immediately returned, and we enjoyed together the darkening shadows cast over the abyss, the rival clamour of the torrent and the storm, and that delightful exaltation of the spirits which sets danger at defiance. A few heavy raindrops alarmed us more than all the terrors of the spot, or rather they recalled our senses, and we retreated by the fearful steps reaching our hotel unwetted and unharmed. The next morning we were again early afoot. The last night's storm had refreshed the air and renewed our strength. We now took a different route, and instead of descending as before, walked through the dark forest along the cliff, sufficiently near its edge to catch fearful glimpses of the scene below. After some time the patch began to descend, and at length brought us to the shanty, commemorated in Miss Sedgwick's Clarence. This is by far the finest point of the falls. There is a little balcony in front of the shanty, literally hanging over the tremendous whirlpool. Though frail, it makes one fancy oneself in safety, and reminded me of the feeling with which I have stood on one side a high gate, watching a roaring bull on the other. The walls of this shanty are literally covered with autographs, and I was inclined to join the laugh against the egotistical trifling, when one of the party discovered Trollope, England, amidst the innumerable scrawls. The well-known characters were hailed with such delight, and I think I shall never again laugh at any one for leaving their name where it is possible a friend may find it. We returned to Utica to dinner, and found that we must either wait till the next day for the Rochester coach, or again submit to the packet-boat. Our impatience induced us to prefer the latter, not very wisely, I think, for every annoyance seemed to increase upon us. The Oneida and the Genesee country are both extremely beautiful, but had we not returned by another route we should have known little about it. From the canal nothing is seen to advantage, and very little is seen at all. My chief amusement, I think, was derived from names. One town, consisting of a whiskey store and a warehouse, is called Port Byron. At Rome, the first name I saw over a store was Remus, doing infinite honour, I thought, to the classic lore of his godfathers and godmothers, but it would be endless to record all the drolleries of this kind which we met with. We arrived at Rochester, a distance of a hundred and forty miles, on the second morning after leaving Utica, fully determined never to enter a canal-boat again, 
at least not in America. Rochester is one of the most famous of the cities built on the Jack and Beanstalk principle. There are many splendid edifices in wood, and certainly more houses, warehouses, factories, and steam engines than ever were collected together in the same space of time. But I was told by a fellow traveller that the stumps of the forest are still to be found firmly rooted in the cellars. The fall of the Genesee is close to the town, and in the course of a few months will perhaps be in the middle of it. It is a noble sheet of water, of a hundred and sixty feet perpendicular fall, but I looked at it through the window of a factory, and as I did not like that, I was obligingly handed to the doorway of a sawing-mill. In short, the great water privilege has been so ingeniously taken advantage of that no point can be found where its voice and its movement are not mixed and confounded with those of the admirable machinery of this flourishing city. The Genesee Fall is renowned as being the last and fatal leap of the adventurous madman, Sam Patch. He had leapt it once before, and rose to the surface of the river in perfect safety, but the last time he was seen to falter as he took the leap, and was never heard of more. It seems that he had some misgivings about his fate, for a pet bear, which he had always taken with him on his former breakneck adventures, and which had constantly leapt after him without injury, he, on this occasion, left behind in the care of a friend, to whom he bequeathed him, in case of his not returning. We saw the bear, which is kept at the principal hotel. He is a noble creature, and more completely tame than I ever saw any animal of the species. Our journey now became wilder every step. The unbroken forest often skirted the road for miles, and the sight of a log hut was an event. Yet the road was, for the greater part of the day, good, running along a natural ridge just wide enough for it. This ridge is a very singular elevation, and by all the inquiry I could make, the favourite theory concerning it is, that it was formerly the boundary of Lake Ontario, near which it passes. When this ridge ceased, the road ceased too, and for the rest of the way to Lockport we were most painfully jumbled and jolted over logs and through bogs, till every joint was nearly dislocated. Lockport is beyond all comparison the strangest-looking place I ever beheld. As fast as half a dozen trees were cut down, a factory was raised up, stumps still contest the ground with pillars, and porticoes are seen to struggle with rocks. It looks as if the demon of machinery, having invaded the peaceful realms of nature, had fixed on Lockport as the battleground on which they should strive for mastery. The fiend insists that the stream should go one way, though the gentle mother had ever led their dancing steps another. Nay, the very rocks must fall before him, and take what form he wills. The battle is lost and won. Nature is fairly routed and driven from the field, and the rattling, crackling, hissing, spitting demon has taken possession of Lockport for ever. We slept there, dismally enough. I never felt more out of humour at what the Americans call improvement. It is, in truth, as it now stands, a most hideous place, and gladly did I leave it behind me. Our next stage was to Lewiston. For some miles before we reached it, we were within sight of the British frontier, and we made our salaams. The monument of the brave General Brock stands on an elevated point near Queenstown, and is visible at a great distance. We breakfasted at Lewiston, but felt every cup of coffee as a sin, so impatient were we as we approached the end of our long pilgrimage to reach the shrine which nature seems to have placed at such a distance from her worshippers on purpose to try the strength of their devotion. A few miles more would bring us to the high altar, but first we had to cross the ferry, for we were determined upon taking our first view from British ground. The Niagara River is very lovely here. The banks are bold, rugged, and richly coloured, both by rocks and woods, and the stream itself is bright, clear, and unspeakably green. In crossing the ferry, a fellow passenger made many inquiries of the young boatman respecting the Battle of Queenstown. He was but a lad, and could remember little about it, but he was a British lad, and his answers smacked strongly of his loyal British feeling. Among other things, the questioner asked if many American citizens had not been thrown from the heights into the river. Why, yes, there was a good many of them, but it was right to show them there was water between us, and you know it might help to keep the rest of them from coming to trouble us on our own ground. 
This phrase, our own ground, gave interest to every mile, or I believe I should have shut my eyes and tried to sleep, that I might annihilate what remained of time and space between me and Niagara. But I was delighted to see British oaks and British roofs and British boys and girls, these latter as if to impress upon us that they were not citizens, made bows and curtsies as we passed, and this little touch of long unknown civility produced great effect. "'See these dear children, mamma! Do they not look English? How I love them!' was the exclamation it produced. End of chapter 32「Chapter thirty three of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three Niagara Arrival at Forsyth's First Sight of the Falls Goat Island The Rapids Buffalo Lake Erie Canandaigua Stagecoach Adventures. At length we reached Niagara. It was the brightest day that June could give and almost any day would have seemed bright that brought me to the object which for years I had languished to look upon. We did not hear the sound of the falls till very near the hotel which overhangs them. As you enter the door you see behind the hall an open space, surrounded by galleries, one above another, and in an instant you feel that from thence the wonder is visible. I trembled like a fool, and my girls clung to me, trembling too, I believe, but with faces beaming with delight. We encountered a waiter who had a sympathy of some sort with us, for he would not let us run through the hall to the first gallery, but ushered us upstairs, and another instant placed us where, at one glance, I saw all I had wished for, hoped for, dreamt of. It is not for me to attempt a description of Niagara. I feel I have no powers for it. After one long, steadfast gaze, we quitted the gallery that we might approach still nearer, and in leaving the house had the good fortune to meet an English gentleman, the accomplished author of Cyril Thornton, who had been introduced to us at New York. He had preceded us by a few days, and knew exactly how and where to lead us. If any man living can describe the scene we looked upon, it is himself, and I trust he will do it. As for myself, I can only say that wonder, terror, and delight completely overwhelmed me. I wept with a strange mixture of pleasure and of pain, and certainly was for some time too violently affected in the physique to be capable of much pleasure. But when this emotion of the senses subsided, and I had recovered some degree of composure, my enjoyment was very great indeed. To say that I was not disappointed is but a weak expression to convey the surprise and astonishment which this long dreamed of scene produced. It has to me something beyond its vastness. There is a shadowy mystery hangs about it which neither the eye nor even the imagination can penetrate. But I dare not dwell on this. It is a dangerous subject, and any attempt to describe the sensations produced must lead direct to nonsense. Exactly at the fall, it is the fall and nothing else you have to look upon. There are not, as at Trenton, mighty rocks and towering forests. There is only the waterfall but it is the fall of an ocean, and were Pelion piled on Ossa on either side of it, we could not look at them. The noise is greatly less than I expected. One can hear with perfect distinctness everything said in an ordinary tone, when quite close to the cataract. The cause of this I imagine to be, that it does not fall immediately among rocks, like the far noisier Potomac, but direct and unbroken, save by its own rebound. The colour of the water, before this rebound hides it in foam and mist, is of the brightest and most delicate green. The violence of the impulse sends it far over the precipice before it falls, and the effect of the ever-varying light through its transparency is, I think, the loveliest thing I ever looked upon. We descended to the edge of the gulf which received the torrent, and thence looked at the horseshoe fall in profile. It seems like awful daring to stand close beside it, and raise one's eyes to its immensity. I think the point the most utterly inconceivable to those who have not seen it, is the centre of the horseshoe. The force of the torrent converges there, and as the heavy mass pours in, twisted, wreathed, and curled together, it gives an idea of irresistible power, 
such as no other object ever conveyed to me. The following anecdote, which I had from good authority, may give some notion of this mighty power. After the last American war, three of our ships stationed on Lake Erie were declared unfit for service and condemned. Some of their officers obtained permission to send them over Niagara Falls. The first was torn to shivers by the rapids, and went over in fragments. The second filled with water before she reached the fall, but the third, which was in better condition, took the leap gallantly, and retained her form till it was hid in the cloud of mist below. A reward of ten dollars was offered for the largest fragment of wood that should be found from either wreck, five for the second, and so on. One morsel only was ever seen, and that about a foot in length, was mashed as by a vice, and its edges notched like the teeth of a saw. What had become of the immense quantity of wood which had been precipitated? What unknown whirlpool had engulfed it, so that, contrary to the very laws of nature, no vestige of the floating material could find its way to the surface? Beyond the horseshoe was Goat Island, and beyond Goat Island the American Fall, bold, straight, and chafed to snowy whiteness by the rocks which meet it. But it does not approach, in sublimity or awful beauty, the wondrous crescent on the other shore. There the form of the mighty cauldron, into which the deluge pours, the hundred silvery torrents congregating round its verge, the smooth and solemn movement with which it rolls its massive volume over the rock, the liquid emerald of its long unbroken waters, the fantastic wreaths which spring to meet it, and then the shadowy mist that veils the horrors of its crash below, constitute a scene almost too enormous in its features for man to look upon. Angels might tremble as they gazed, and I should deem the nerves obtuse rather than strong, which did not quail at the first sight of this stupendous cataract. Minute local particulars can be of no interest to those who have not felt their influence for pleasure or for pain. I will not tell of giddy stairs which scale the very edge of the torrent, nor of beetling slabs of table-rock, broken and breaking, on which, shudder as you may, you must take your stand, or lose your reputation as a tourist. All these feats were performed again and again, even on the first day of our arrival, and most earthly weary was I when the day was done, though I would not lose the remembrance of it to purchase the addition of many soft and silken ones to my existence. By four o'clock the next morning I was again at the little shanty close to the horseshoe fall, which seems reared in water rather than in air, and took an early shower-bath of spray. Much is concealed at this early hour by the heavy vapour, but there was a charm in its very obscurity, and every moment as the light increased, cloud after cloud rolled off, till the vast wonder was again before me. It is in the afternoon that the rainbow is visible from the British side, and it is a lovely feature in the mighty landscape. The gay art springs from fall to fall, a fairy bridge. After breakfast we crossed to the American side and explored Goat Island. The passage across the Niagara, directly in face of the falls, is one of the most delightful little voyages imaginable. The boat crosses marvellously near them, and within reach of a light shower of spray. Real safety and apparent danger have each their share in the pleasure felt. The river is here two hundred feet deep. The passage up the rock brings you close upon the American cataract. It is a vast sheet, and has all the sublimity that height and width and uproar can give, but it has none of the magic of its rival about it. Goat Island has at all points a fine view of the rapids. The furious velocity with which they rush onward to the abyss is terrific, and the throwing a bridge across them was a work of noble daring. Below the falls the river runs between lofty rocks, crowned with unbroken forests, this scene forms a striking contrast to the level shores above the cataract. It appears as if the level of the river had been broken up by some volcanic force. The Niagara flows out of Lake Erie, a broad, deep river, but for several miles its course is tranquil, and its shores perfectly level. By degrees its bed begins to sink, and the glassy smoothness is disturbed by a slight ripple. 
the inverted trees that before lay so softly still upon its bosom become twisted and tortured till they lose their form and seem madly to mix in the tumult that destroys them the current becomes more rapid at every step till rock after rock has chafed the stream to fury making the green one white this lasts for a mile and then down sink the rocks at once one hundred and fifty feet and the enormous flood falls after them god said let there be a cataract and it was so when the river has reached its new level the precipice on either side shows a terrific chasm of solid rock some beautiful plants are clinging to its sides and oak ash and cedar in many places clothe their terrors with rich foliage this violent transition from level shores to a deep ravine seems to indicate some great convulsion as its cause and when i heard of a burning spring close by i fancied the volcanic power still at work and that the wonders of the region might yet increase we passed four delightful days of excitement and fatigue we drenched ourselves in spray we cut our feet on the rocks we blistered our faces in the sun we looked up the cataract and down the cataract we perched ourselves on every pinnacle we could find we dipped our fingers in the flood at a few yards distance from its thundering fall in short we strove to fill as many niches of memory with niagara as possible and i think the images will be within the power of recall for ever we met many groups of tourists in our walks chiefly american but they were or we fancied they were but little observant of the wonders around them one day we were seated on a point of the cliff near the ferry which commands a view of both the falls this by the way is considered as the finest general view of the scene one of our party was employed in attempting to sketch what however i believe it is impossible for any pencil to convey an idea of to those who have not seen it we had borrowed two or three chairs from a neighbouring cottage and amongst us had gathered a quantity of boughs which with the aid of shawls and parasols we had contrived to weave into a shelter from the midday sun so that altogether i have no doubt we looked very cool and comfortable a large party who had crossed from the american side wound up the steep ascent from the place where the boat had left them in doing so their backs were turned to the cataracts and as they approached the summit our party was the principal object before them they all stood perfectly still to look at us this first examination was performed at the distance of about a dozen yards from the spot we occupied and lasted about five minutes by which time they had recovered breath and acquired courage they then advanced in a body and one or two of them began to examine wrong side upwards the work of the sketcher in doing which they stood precisely between him and his object but of this i think it is very probable they were not aware some among them next began to question us as to how long we had been at the falls whether there were much company if we were not from the old country and the like in return we learnt that they were just arrived yet not one of them there were eight ever turned the head even for a moment to look at the most stupendous spectacle that nature has to show the company at the hotel changed almost every day many parties arrived in the morning walked to the falls returned to the hotel to dinner and departed by coach immediately after it many groups were indescribably whimsical both in appearance and manner now and then a first-rate dandy shot in among us like a falling star on one occasion when we were in the beautiful gallery at the back of the hotel which overlooks the horseshoe fall we saw the booted leg of one of this graceful race protruded from the window which commands the view while his person was thrown back in his chair and his head enveloped in a cloud of tobacco smoke i have repeatedly remarked when it has happened to me to meet any ultra-fine men among the wilder and more imposing scenes of our own land that they throw off in a great degree their airs and their townliness as some one cleverly calls these simagrees as if ashamed to play their fantastic tricks before the god of nature when so forcibly reminded of his presence and more than once on these occasions i have been surprised to find how much intellect lurked behind the inane mask of fashion but in america the effect of fine scenery upon this class of persons is different for it is exactly when amongst it 
that the most strenuous efforts at elegant nonchalance are perceptible among the young exquisites of the western world it is true that they have little leisure for the display of grace in the daily routine of commercial activity in which their lives are passed and this certainly offers a satisfactory explanation of the fact above stated fortunately for our enjoyment the solemn character of the scene was but little broken in upon by these gentry every one who comes to forsyth's hotel except mrs bogle corbett walks to the shanty writes their name in a book which is kept there and for the most part descends by the spiral staircase which leads from the little platform before it to the rocks below here they find another shanty but a few yards from the entrance of that wondrous cavern which is formed by the falling flood on one side and by the mighty rock over which it pours on the other to this frail shelter from the wild uproar and the blinding spray nearly all the touring gentlemen and even many of the pretty ladies find their way but here i often saw their noble daring fail and have watched them dripping and draggled turn again to the sheltering stairs leaving us in full possession of the awful scene we so dearly love to gaze upon how utterly futile must every attempt be to describe the spot how vain every effort to convey an idea of the sensations it produces why is it so exquisite a pleasure to stand for hours drenched in spray stunned by the ceaseless roar trembling from the concussion that shakes the very rock you cling to and breathing painfully in the moist atmosphere that seems to have less of air than water in it yet pleasure it is and i almost think the greatest i ever enjoyed we more than once approached the entrance to this appalling cavern but i never fairly entered it though two or three of my party did i lost my breath entirely and the pain at my chest was so severe that not all my curiosity could enable me to endure it what was that cavern of the winds of which we heard of old compared to this a mightier spirit than aeolus reigns here nor was this spot of dread and danger the only one in which we found ourselves alone the path taken by the company to the shanty which contained the book of names was always the same this wound down the steep bank from the gate of the hotel garden and was rendered tolerably easy by its repeated doublings but it was by no means the best calculated to manage to advantage the pleasure of the stranger in his approach to the spot all others however seemed left for us alone during our stay we saw the commencement of another staircase intended to rival an attraction that at present in use it is but a few yards from it and can in no way i think contribute to the convenience of the descent the erection of the central shaft of this spiral staircase was a most tremendous operation and made me sick and giddy as i watched it after it had been made fast at the bottom the carpenters swung themselves off the rocks by means of ropes to the beams which traversed it and as they sat across them in the midst of the spray and the uproar i thought i had never seen life periled so wantonly but the work proceeded without accident and was nearly finished before we left the hotel it was a sort of pang to take what we knew must be our last look at niagara but we had to do it as the americans say and left it on the tenth of june for buffalo the drive along the river above the falls is as beautiful as a clear stream of a mile in width can make it and the road continues close to it till you reach the ferry at black rock we welcomed almost with a shout the british colours which we saw for the first time on commodore barry's pretty sloop the bulldog which we passed as it was towing up the river to lake erie the commodore being about to make a tour of the lakes at black rock we crossed again into the united states and a few miles of horrible jolting brought us to buffalo of all the thousand and one towns i saw in america i think buffalo is the queerest looking it is not quite so wild as lockport but all the buildings have the appearance of having been run up in a hurry though everything has an air of great pretension there are porticos columns domes and colonnades but all in wood everybody tells you there as in all their other new-born towns and everybody believes that their improvement and their progression are more rapid more wonderful than the earth ever before witnessed 
while to me the only wonder is how so many thousands, nay millions of persons, can be found in the nineteenth century who can be content so to live. Surely this country may be said to spread rather than to rise. The Eagle Hotel, an immense wooden fabric, has all the pretension of a splendid establishment, but its monstrous corridors, low ceilings, and intricate chambers gave me the feeling of a catacomb rather than a house. We arrived after the table d'hote tea-drinking was over, and supped comfortably enough with the gentleman who accompanied us from the falls, but the next morning we breakfasted in a long, low, narrow room with a hundred persons, and anything less like comfort can hardly be imagined. What can induce so many intellectual citizens to prefer these long, silent tables, scantily covered with morsels of fried ham, salt fish, and liver? to a comfortable loaf of bread with their wives and children at home? How greatly should I prefer eating my daily meals with my family in an Indian wigwam to boarding at a table d'hote in these capacious hotels? The custom, however, seems universal throughout the country. At least we have met it without a shadow of variation as to its general features, from New Orleans to Buffalo. Lake Erie has no beauty to my eyes. It is not the sea, and it is not the river nor has it the beautiful scenery generally found round smaller lakes. The only interest its unmeaning expanse gave me arose from remembering that its waters, there so tame and tranquil, were destined to leap the gulf of Niagara. A dreadful road, through forests only beginning to be felled, brought us to Avon. It is a straggling, ugly little place, and not any of their Romes, Carthages, Ithacas, or Athens, ever provoked me by their name so much. This Avon flows sweetly with nothing but whisky and tobacco juice. The next day's journey was much more interesting, for it showed us the lake of Canandaigua. It is about eighteen miles long, but narrow enough to bring the opposite shore clothed with rich foliage near to the eye. The background is a ridge of mountains. Perhaps the state of the atmosphere lent an unusual charm to the scene, one of those sudden thunderstorms, so rapid in approach, and so sombre in colouring, that they changed the whole aspect of things in a moment, rose over the mountains, and passed across the lake while we looked upon it. Another feature in the scene gave a living, but most sad interest to it. A glaring wooden hotel, as fine as paint and porticos can make it, overhangs the lake. Beside it stands a shed for cattle. To this shed, and close by the white man's mushroom palace, two Indians had crept to seek a shelter from the storm. The one was an aged man, whose venerable head and attitude and expression indicated the profoundest melancholy. The other was a youth, and in his deep-set eyes there was a quiet sadness more touching still. There they stood, the native rightful lords of the fair land, looking out upon the lovely lake which yet bore the name their fathers had given it, watching the threatening storm that brooded there. A more fearful one had already burst over them. Though I have mentioned the lake first, the little town of Canandaigua precedes it, in returning from the west. It is as pretty a village as ever man contrived to build. Every house is surrounded by an ample garden, and at that flowery season they were half buried in roses. It is true these houses are of wood, but they are so neatly painted, in such perfect repair, and show so well within their leafy setting, that it is impossible not to admire them. Forty-six miles farther is Geneva, beautifully situated on Seneca Lake. This, too, is a lovely sheet of water, and I think the town may rival its European namesake in beauty. We slept at Auburn, celebrated for its prison, where the highly approved system of American discipline originated. In this part of the country there is no want of churches. Every little village has its wooden temple, and many of them, too, that the Methodists and Presbyterians may not clash. We passed through an Indian reserve, and the untouched forests again hung close upon the road. Repeated groups of Indians passed us, and we remarked that they were much cleaner and better dressed than those we had met wandering far from their homes. The blankets which they used so gracefully as mantles were as white as snow. We took advantage of the loss of a horse's shoe to leave the coach, and approach a large party of them, consisting of men, women, and children, 
who were regaling themselves with I know not what, but milk made a part of the repast. They could not talk to us, but they received us with smiles, and seemed to understand when we asked if they had moccasins to sell, for they shook their sable locks and answered no. A beautiful grove of butternut trees was pointed out to us as the spot where the chiefs of the six nations used to hold their senate. Our informer told me that he had been present at several of their meetings, and although he knew but little of their language, the power of their eloquence was evident from the great effect it produced among themselves. Towards the end of this day we encountered an adventure which revived our doubts whether the invading white men, in chasing the poor Indians from their forests, have done much towards civilizing the land. For myself, I almost prefer the indigenous manner to the exotic. The coach stopped to take in a lady at Vernon. She entered and completely filled the last vacant inch of our vehicle, for we were eight before. But no sooner was she seated than her beau came forward with a most enormous wooden best bonnet box. He paused for a while to meditate the possibilities raised it as if to place it on our laps, sunk it as if to put it beneath our feet. Both alike appeared impossible, when in true Yankee style he addressed one of the party with, If you'll just step out a minute, I guess I'll find room for it. Perhaps so, but how shall I find room for myself afterwards? This was uttered in European accents, and in an instant half a dozen whiskey drinkers stepped from before the whiskey store and took the part of the bow. That's because you'll be English travellers, I expect, but we have travelled in better countries than Europe. We have travelled in America, and the box will go, I calculate. We remonstrated on the evident injustice of the proceeding, and I ventured to say that as we had none of us any luggage in the carriage, because the space was so very small, I thought a chance passenger could have no right so greatly to incommode us. Right, there they go, that's just their way, that will do in Europe, maybe, but it sounds just like English tyranny now, don't it? But it won't do here. And thereupon he began thrusting in the wooden box against our legs with all his strength. No law, sir, can permit such conduct as this. Law, exclaimed a gentleman very particularly drunk, we makes our own laws and governs our own selves. Law, echoed another gentleman of Vernon, this is a free country, we have no laws here, and we don't want no foreign power to tyrannize over us. I give the words exactly. It is, however, but fair to state that the party had evidently been drinking more than a usual portion of whiskey, but perhaps in whiskey as in wine, truth may come to light. At any rate, the people of the western paradise follow the Gentiles in this, that they are a law unto themselves. During the contest, the coachman sat upon the box without saying a word, but seemed greatly to enjoy the joke. The question of the box, however, was finally decided in our favour by the nature of the human material, which cannot be compressed beyond a certain degree. For the great part of this day we had the good fortune to have a gentleman and his daughter for our fellow travellers, who were extremely intelligent and agreeable, but I nearly got myself into a scrape by venturing to remark upon a phrase used by the gentleman, and which had met me at every corner from the time I first entered the country. We had been talking of pictures, and I had endeavoured to adhere to the rule I had laid down for myself, of saying very little where I could say nothing agreeable. At length he named an American artist with whose works I was very familiar, and having declared him equal to Lawrence, judging by his portrait of West now at New York, he added, and what is more, madam, he is perfectly self-taught. I prudently took a few moments before I answered, for the equalling of our immortal Lawrence to a most vile dauber stuck in my throat. I could not say amen, so for some time I said nothing, but at last I remarked on the frequency with which I had heard this phrase of self-taught used, not as an apology, but as positive praise. Well, madam, can there be a higher praise? Certainly not, if spoken of the individual merits of a person, without the means of instruction, but I do not understand it when applied as praise to his works. Not understand it, madam? Is it not attributing genius to the author? And what is teaching compared to that? 
I do not wish to repeat all my own bon mots in praise of study, and on the disadvantages of profound ignorance, but I would, willingly if I could, give an idea of the mixed indignation and contempt expressed by our companion at the idea that study was necessary to the formation of taste and to the development of genius. At last, however, he closed the discussion thus. There is no use in disputing a point that is already settled, madam. The best judges declare that Mr. H.'s portraits are equal to that of Lawrence. Who is it who has passed this judgment, sir? The men of taste of America, madam. I then asked him if he thought it was going to rain. The stages do not appear to have any regular stations at which to stop for breakfast, dinner, and supper. These necessary interludes, therefore, being generally impromptu, were abominably bad. We were amused by the patient manner in which our American fellow-travellers ate whatever was set before them, without uttering a word of complaint or making any effort to improve it, but no sooner receded in the stage than they began their complaints. "'Twas a shame, twas a robbery, twas poisoning folks, and the like. I, at last, asked the reason of this, and why they did not remonstrate. "'Because, madam, no American gentleman or lady that keeps an inn won't bear to be found fault with.' We reached Utica very late and very weary, but the delights of a good hotel and perfect civility sent us in good humour to bed, and we arose sufficiently refreshed to enjoy a day's journey through some of the loveliest scenery in the world. Who is it that says America is not picturesque? I forget but surely he never travelled from Utica to Albany. I really cannot conceive that any country can furnish a drive of ninety-six miles more beautiful or more varied in its beauty. The road follows the Mohawk River, which flows through scenes changing from fields, waving with plenty, to rocks and woods. Gentle slopes, covered with cattle, are divided from each other by precipices five hundred feet high. Around the little falls there is a character of beauty as singular as it is striking. Here, as I observed of many other American rivers, the stream appears to run in a much narrower channel than it once occupied, and the space which it seems formerly to have filled is now covered with bright green herbage, save that at intervals large masses of rock rise abruptly from the level turf. These are crowned with all such trees as love the scanty diet which a rock affords. Dwarf oak, cedars, and the mountain ash are grouped in a hundred different ways among them. Each clump you look upon is lovelier than its neighbour. I never saw so sweetly wild a spot. I was surprised to hear a fellow traveller say, as we passed a point of peculiar beauty, all this neighbourhood belongs, or did belong, to Mr. Edward Ellis, an English member of Parliament, but he has sold a deal of it, and now, madam, you may see it begins to improve. And he pointed to a great wooden edifice, where, on the white paint, cash for rags, in letters three feet high, might be seen. I then remembered that it was near this spot that my Yankee friend had made his complaint against English indifference to water privilege. He did not name Mr. Edward Ellis, but doubtless he was the English as never thought of improvement. I have often confessed to my conscious incapacity for description, but I must repeat it here to apologize for my passing so dully through this matchless valley of the Mohawk. I would that some British artist, strong in youthful daring, would take my word for it and pass over for a summer pilgrimage through the state of New York. In very earnest, he would wisely, for I question if the world could furnish within the same space, and with equal facility of access, so many subjects for his pencil. Mountains, forests, rocks, lakes, rivers, cataracts, all in perfection. But he must be bold as a lion in colouring, or he will make nothing of it. There is a clearness of atmosphere, a strength of chiaroscuro, a massiveness in the foliage, and a brilliance of contrast that must make a colorist of any one who has an eye. He must have courage to dip his pencil in shadows as black as night, and light that might blind an eagle. As I presume my young artist to be an enthusiast, he must first go direct to Niagara, or even in the Mohawk Valley his pinioned wing may droop. If his fever run very high, he may slake his thirst at Trenton, 
and while there he will not dream of anything beyond it. Should my advice be taken, I will ask the young adventurer on his return, when he shall have made a prodigious quantity of money by my hint, to reward me by two sketches. One shall be the lake of Canandaigua, the other the Indian Senate Grove of Butternuts. During our journey, I forget on which day of it, a particular spot in the forest, at some distance from the road, was pointed out to us as the scene of a true but very romantic story. During the great and terrible French Revolution, 1792, a young nobleman escaped from the scene of horror, having with difficulty saved his head, and without the possibility of saving anything else. He arrived at New York nearly destitute, and after passing his life not only in splendour, but in the splendour of the court of France, he found himself jostled by the busy population of the new world without a dollar between him and starvation. In such a situation one might almost sigh for the guillotine. The young noble strove to labour, but who would purchase the trembling efforts of his white hands while the sturdy strength of many a black Hercules was in the market? He abandoned the vain attempt to sustain himself by the aid of his fellow men, and determined to seek a refuge in the forest. A few shillings only remained to him. He purchased an axe and reached the Oneida territory. He felled a few of the slenderest trees and made himself a shelter that Robinson Crusoe would have laughed at, for it did not keep out the rain. Want of food, exposure to the weather, and unwanted toil produced the natural result. The unfortunate young man fell sick, and stretched upon the reeking earth, stifled rather than sheltered by the withering boughs which hung over him. He lay parched with thirst and shivering in ague, with the one last earthly hope that each heavy moment would prove the last. Near to the spot which he had chosen for his miserable rest, but totally concealed from it by the thick forest, was the last straggling wigwam of an Indian village. It is not known how many days the unhappy man had lain without food, but he was quite insensible when a young squaw, whom chance had brought from this wigwam to his hut, entered and found him alive, but totally insensible. The heart of woman is, I believe, pretty much the same everywhere. The young girl paused not to think whether he were white or red, but her fleet feet rested not till she had brought milk, rum, and blankets, and when the sufferer recovered his senses, his head was supported on her lap, while, with the gentle tenderness of a mother, she found means to make him swallow the restorative she had brought. No black eyes in the world, be they of France, Italy, or even of Spain, can speak more plainly of kindness than the large, deep-set orbs of a squaw. This is a language that all nations can understand, and the poor Frenchman read most clearly, in the anxious glance of his gentle nurse, that he should not die forsaken. So far the story is romantic enough, and what follows is hardly less so. The squaw found means to introduce her white friend to her tribe. He was adopted as their brother, speedily acquired their language, and assumed their dress and manner of life. His gratitude to his preserver soon ripened into love, and if the chronicle spoke true, the French noble and the American savage were more than passing happy as man and wife, and it was not till he saw himself the father of many thriving children that the exile began to feel a wish of rising again from savage to civilized existence. My historian did not explain what his project was in visiting New York, but he did so in the habit of an Indian, and learned enough of the restored tranquillity of his country to give him hope that some of the broad lands that he had left there might be restored to him. I have made my story already too long, and must not linger upon it farther, than to say that his hopes were fulfilled, and that, of a large and flourishing family, some are settled in France, and some remained in America, one of these, I understood, was a lawyer at New York, while the hero and the heroine of the tale continue to inhabit the Oneida country, not in a wigwam, however, but in a good house, in a beautiful situation, with all the comforts of civilized life around them. Such was the narrative we listened to from a stage-coach companion, and it appears to me sufficiently interesting to repeat, though I have no better authority to quote for its truth than the assertion of this unknown traveller. 
End of chapter 33「Chapter 34 of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 34 Return to New York Conclusion The comfortable Delphi Hotel again received us at Albany on the 14th of June, and we decided upon passing the following day there, both to see the place and to recruit our strength, which we began to feel we had taxed severely by a very fatiguing journey in most oppressively hot weather. It would have been difficult to find a better station for repose. The rooms were large and airy, and ice was furnished in most profuse abundance. But notwithstanding the manifold advantages of this excellent hotel, I was surprised at the un-English arrangement communicated to me by two ladies with whom we made a speaking acquaintance, by which it appeared that they made it their permanent home. These ladies were a mother and daughter. The daughter was an extremely pretty young married woman, with two little children. Where the husbands were, or whether they were dead or alive, I know not. But they told me they had been boarding there above a year. They breakfasted, dined, and supped at the table d'hôte, with from twenty to a hundred people, as accident might decide, dressed very smart, played on the piano in the public sitting-room, and assured me they were particularly comfortable and well accommodated. What a life! Some parts of the town are very handsome. The town hall, the chamber of representatives, and some other public buildings stand well on a hill that overlooks the Hudson, with ample enclosures of grass and trees around them. Many of the shops are large and showily set out. I was amused by a national trait which met me at one of them. I entered it to purchase some eau de cologne, but finding what was offered to me extremely bad and very cheap, I asked if they had none at a higher price and better. "'You are a stranger, I guess,' was the answer. "'The Yankees want low price, that's all. They don't stand so much for goodness as the English.' Nothing could be more beautiful than our passage down the Hudson on the following day. As I thought of some of my friends in England, dear lovers of the picturesque, I could not but exclaim, "'Que je vous plains, que je vous plains, vous ne la verrez pas. Not even a moving panoramic view gliding before their eyes for an hour together, in all the scenic splendour of Drury Lane or Covent Garden, could give them an idea of it. They could only see one side at a time. The change, the contrast, the ceaseless variety of beauty, as you skim from side to side, the liquid smoothness of the broad mirror that reflects the scene, and most of all the clear bright air through which you look at it, all this can only be seen and believed by crossing the Atlantic. As we approached New York, the burning heat of the day relaxed, and the long shadows of evening fell coolly on the beautiful villas we passed. I really can conceive nothing more exquisitely lovely than this approach to the city. The magnificent boldness of the Jersey shore on the one side, and the luxurious softness of the shady lawns on the other, with the vast silvery stream that flows between them, altogether form a picture which may well excuse a traveller for saying once and again that the Hudson River can be surpassed in beauty by none on the outside of paradise. It was nearly dark when we reached the city, and it was with great satisfaction that we found our comfortable apartments in Hudson Street unoccupied, and our pretty, kind Irish hostess willing to receive us again. We passed another fortnight there, and again we enjoyed the elegant hospitality of New York, though now it was offered from beneath the shade of their beautiful villas. In truth, were all America like this fair city, and all, no, only a small proportion of its population like the friends we left there, I should say that the land was the fairest in the world. But the time was come to bid it adieu. The important business of securing our homeward passage was to be performed. One must know what it is to cross the ocean before the immense importance of all the little details of accommodation can be understood. The anxious first look, into the face of the captain, to ascertain if he be gentle or rough. Another, scarcely less important, in that of the steward, generally a sable one, but not the less expressive. 
the accurate but rapid glance of measurement thrown round the little state-rooms, another at the good or bad arrangement of the staircase, by which you are to stumble up and stumble down, from cabin to deck and from deck to cabin, all this they only can understand who have felt it. At length, however, this interesting affair was settled, and most happily. The appearance promised well, and the performance bettered it. We hastened to pack up our trumpery, as Captain Mervyn unkindly calls the paraphernalia of the ladies, and among the rest my six hundred pages of griffinage. There is enough of it yet, yet I must add a few more lines. I suspect that what I have written will make it evident that I do not like America. Now, as it happens that I met with individuals there, whom I love and admire, far beyond the love and admiration of ordinary acquaintance, and as I declare the country to be fair to the eye, and most richly teeming with the gifts of plenty, I am led to ask myself why it is that I do not like it. I would willingly know myself and confess to others why it is that neither its beauty nor its abundance can suffice to neutralize or greatly soften the distaste which the aggregate of my recollections has left upon my mind. I remember hearing it said many years ago, when the advantages and disadvantages of a particular residence were being discussed, that it was the who and not the where that made the difference between the pleasant or unpleasant residence. The truth of the observation struck me forcibly when I heard it, and it has been recalled to my mind since by the constantly recurring evidence of its justness. In applying this to America, I speak not of my friends, nor of my friends' friends. The small patrician band is a race apart. They live with each other and for each other, mix wondrously little with the high matters of state, which they seem to leave rather supinely to their tailors and tinkers, and are no more to be taken as a sample of the American people than the head of Lord Byron as a sample of the heads of the British peerage. I speak not of these, but of the population generally, as seen in town and country, among the rich and the poor, in the slave states and the free states. I do not like them, I do not like their principles, I do not like their manners, I do not like their opinions. Both as a woman and as a stranger it might be unseemly for me to say that I do not like their government, and therefore I will not say so. That it is one which pleases themselves is most certain, and this is considerably more important than pleasing all the travelling old ladies in the world. I entered the country at New Orleans, remained for more than two years west of the Alleghanies, and passed another year among the Atlantic cities and the country around them. I conversed during this time with citizens of all orders and degrees, and I never heard from any one a single disparaging word against their government. It is not, therefore, surprising that when the people of that country hear strangers questioning the wisdom of their institutions, and expressing disapprobation at some of their effects, they should set it down either to an incapacity of judging, or a malicious feeling of envy and ill-will. How can any one in their senses doubt the excellence of a government which we have tried for half a century, and loved the better the longer we have known it? Such is the natural inquiry of every American when the excellence of their government is doubted, and I am inclined to answer that no one in their senses who has visited the country and known the people can doubt its fitness for them, such as they are now, or its utter unfitness for any other people. Whether the government has made the people what they are, or whether the people have made the government what it is to suit themselves, I know not. But if the latter, they have shown a consummation of wisdom which the assembled world may look on and admire. It is a matter of historical notoriety that the original stock of the white population now inhabiting the United States were persons who had banished themselves or were banished from the mother country. The land they found was favourable to their increase and in prosperity. The colony grew and flourished. Years rolled on, and the children, the grandchildren, and the great-grandchildren of the first settlers replenished the land, and found it flowing with milk and honey. That they should wish to keep this milk and honey to themselves is not very surprising. What did the mother country do for them? She sent them out gay and gallant officers to guard their frontier, the which they thought they could guard as well themselves, and then she taxed their tea. Now this was disagreeable 
and to atone for it the distant colony had no great share in her mother's grace and glory. It was not from among them that her high and mighty were chosen. The rays which emanated from that bright sun of honour, the British throne, reached them but feebly. They knew not, they cared not, for her kings nor her heroes. Their thriftiest trader was their noblest man. The holy seats of learning were but the cradles of superstition. The splendour of the aristocracy but a leech that drew their golden blood. The wealth, the learning, the glory of Britain was to them nothing. The having their own way, everything. Can any blame their wish to obtain it? Can any lament that they succeeded? And now the day was their own, what should they do next? Their elders drew together and said, Let us make a government that shall suit us all. Let it be rude and rough and noisy. Let it not affect either dignity, glory, or splendour. Let it interfere with no man's will, nor meddle with any man's business. Let us have neither tithes nor taxes, game laws nor poor laws. Let every man have a hand in making the laws, and no man be troubled about keeping them. Let not our magistrates wear purple, nor our judges ermine. If a man grow rich, let us take care that his grandson be poor, and then we shall all keep equal. Let every man take care of himself, and if England should come to bother us again, why then we will fight altogether. Could anything be better imagined than such a government for a people so circumstanced, or is it strange that they are contented with it? Still less is it strange that those who have lived in the repose of order, and felt secure that their country could go on very well, and its business proceed without their bawling and squalling, scratching and scrambling to help it, should bless the gods that they are not republicans. So far all is well. That they should prefer a constitution which suits them so admirably, to one which would not suit them at all, is surely no cause of quarrel on our part nor should it be such on theirs, if we feel no inclination to exchange the institutions which have made us what we are for any other on the face of the earth. But when a native of Europe visits America, a most extraordinary species of tyranny is set in action against him, and as far as my reading and experience have enabled me to judge, it is such as no other country has ever exercised against strangers. The Frenchman visits England, he is abîmé d'ennui at our stately dinners, shrugs his shoulders at our corps de ballet, and laughs à gorge déployée at our passion for driving and our partial affection for roast beef and plum pudding. The Englishman returns the visit, and the first thing he does on arriving at Paris is to hasten to le théâtre des variétés that he may see les Anglaises pour rire, and if among the crowd of laughters you hear a note of more cordial mirth than the rest, seek out the person from whom it proceeds, and you will find the Englishman. The Italian comes to our green island and groans at our climate. He vows that the air which destroys a statue cannot be wholesome for man. He sighs for orange trees and macaroni, and smiles at the pretensions of a nation to poetry, while no epics are chanted through her streets. Yet we welcome the sensitive southern with all kindness, and listen to his complaints with interest, cultivate our little orange trees, and teach our children to lisp tasso, in the hope of becoming more agreeable. Yet we are not at all superior to the rest of Europe, in our endurance of censure, nor is this wish to profit by it all peculiar to the English. We laugh at, and find fault with our neighbours, quite as freely as they do with us, and they join the laugh, and adopt our fashions and our customs. These mutual pleasantries produce no shadow of unkindly feeling, and as long as the governments are at peace with each other, the individuals of every nation in Europe make it a matter of pride as well as of pleasure to meet each other frequently, to discuss, compare, and reason upon their national varieties, and to vote it a mark of fashion and good taste to imitate each other in all the external embellishments of life. The consequence of this is most pleasantly perceptible at the present time, in every capital of Europe. The long peace has given time for each to catch from each what was best in customs and manners, and the rapid advance of refinement and general information has been the result. To those who have been accustomed to this state of things, the contrast upon crossing to the new world is inconceivably annoying, 
and it cannot be doubted that this is one great cause of the general feeling of irksomeness and fatigue of spirits which hangs upon the memory while recalling the hours past in american society a single word indicative of doubt that anything or everything in that country is not the very best in the world produces an effect which must be seen and felt to be understood if the citizens of the United States were indeed the devoted patriots they call themselves, they would surely not thus encrust themselves in the hard, dry, stubborn persuasion that they are the first and best of the human race, that nothing is to be learned but what they are able to teach, and that nothing is worth having which they do not possess. The art of man could hardly discover a more effectual antidote to improvement than this persuasion and yet I never listened to any public oration, or read any work professedly addressed to the country, in which they did not labour to impress it on the minds of the people. To hint to the generality of Americans, that the silent current of events may change their beloved government, is not the way to please them, but in truth they need be tormented with no such fear as long as by common consent they can keep down the pre-eminence which nature has assigned to great powers, as long as they can prevent human respect and human honour from resting upon high talent, gracious manners, and exalted station, so long may they be sure of going on as they are. I have been told, however, that there are some among them who would gladly see a change, some who with the wisdom of philosophers and the fair candour of gentlemen shrink from a profession of equality which they feel to be untrue and believe to be impossible. I can well believe that such there are, though to me no such opinions were communicated, and most truly should I rejoice to see power pass into such hands. If this ever happens, if refinement once creeps in among them, if they once learn to cling to the graces, the honours, the chivalry of life, then we shall say farewell to American equality, and welcome to European fellowship one of the finest countries of the earth. End of chapter 34 End of Domestic Manners of the Americans by Francis Trollope